Independence Day in Guatemala, President Lucas Garcia presides over his small country's formal and solemn celebrations. Indian onlookers watch a parade deeply rooted in Guatemala's colonial past, a distinctively Latin American scene. Behind the bulletproof glass, a strongman president inspects the pride of his military forces. Guatemala is not a dictatorship. President Garcia next year completes a four-year term of office. Yet democracy is a thin coating here. Behind the facade, claim its opponents, is one of the most ruthlessly oppressive regimes in Central America. Guatemala is the third largest of the small Central American republics. Bordered to the north and west by Mexico, one of its southern neighbors is the strike-torn El Salvador. The guerrilla war in El Salvador has dominated recent press coverage of the region. But unrest is growing here in Guatemala. Its internal war may soon rival that of its neighbor. This nation of just over 7 million people faces an uncertain and possibly bloody future. This colorful, largely military ceremony of today seems trivial when set against the country's rich and glorious past. These are the ruins at Tikal in the north of the country, one of the centers of Mayan civilization. This culture flourished from the 3rd to the 16th centuries. It produced brilliant achievements in architecture, astronomy, and mathematics. Tikal, one of the oldest Mayan cities, is also the most impressive. The detail on the stonework is merely one facet of the artistic achievements this culture produced. They're still discovering Mayan temples and palaces here in the dense jungle. Radar has pinpointed a vast canal system which drained the swamps. But there is still no hint as to why the Mayan cities fell into ruin before the Spanish conquest. The history of the Guatemalans has been less glorious in the colonial and modern periods. Political turmoil has marked the past 150 years of Guatemalan history. Simón Bolívar is commemorated as a champion of independence from Spain. But independence did not lead to the liberalism and democracy of which men like Bolivar dreamed. A program of social reform was initiated after the Second World War, but land reforms were bitterly opposed by the country's landowners. A coup in 1954 brought them to an end. Today, Guatemala's politics are dominated by the extreme right. Mario Sandoval is the favorite to become the next president to succeed Lucas Garcia. A former vice president, he's closely associated with the country's military and business leaders. He leads the ultra-conservative national freedom movement. Their flags carry the national colors as a symbol of their nationalism. In his rallies, Sandoval seeks to whip up anti-communist fervor. Sandoval's message to the electorate is a simple one. He believes that Central America is the decisive battleground in the fight against communism. According to his view, if the communists capture Central America, the rest of the world is at risk. He pledges that if he becomes president, he'll put an end to the Red Menace. The message of the National Liberation Movement is delivered by its vice presidential candidate. Leader Sandoval is the victim of a throat ailment which prevents him from giving public speeches. In the extreme atmosphere of Guatemalan politics, the center parties have been squeezed out. 
In the name of fighting communism, all opposition is being persecuted. 80 Christian Democrat Party members have been assassinated in the past 18 months. The political violence is taking a heavy toll on the economy. Guatemala used to have the most diversified and strongest economy in the region, but tourism has declined dramatically. Now there is only enough international reserves to pay for three months' imports. It's believed there can be no hope for the economy until the violence subsides. Here, close to Guatemala City, the government still has firm control. On this large landed estate, migrant workers sort and bag coffee beans from this season's crop, producing over 40% of the country's export earnings. Guatemala is an underdeveloped, primarily agricultural country. Wealthy landowners control most of the productive land and produce the export crops. A brief attempt at agricultural reform after the Second World War failed. Since then, peasant communities have found their land falling prey to landowner encroachment. Most peasants do not now own enough land to support their families. Every season, they become migrant workers on the large estates. The work is hard, 10 to 12 hours a day, and pay and conditions can be appalling. To work the estates, migrants are recruited in squads of 20 to 300 people from the same village. Often the recruiter will pocket the migrants' entire wages, owed to him because of loans at 100% interest. The system is almost self-perpetuating. Officially, there are laws controlling conditions, but regulations are ignored, and a bribe quickly diverts any inquiries. The situation on the land is providing the unrest which guerrilla movements are seeking to exploit. Traditionally, the Indians of Central and South America are extremely distrustful of outsiders. A guerrilla movement in Bolivia, led by Che Guevara, failed dismally because it failed to win Indian support. Here in Guatemala, however, the situation appears to be different. The guerrilla organizations, like the guerrilla army of the poor, have made a real attempt to recruit among the Indians. And because the land question is such a burning issue, the Indians appear to be offering support. As the Indians turn to the guerrilla movements, the countryside is becoming a battleground. The guerrilla army of the poor claims to have occupied 70 villages for short periods in the past year. Their revolutionary program of agrarian reform and social justice has struck a responsive chord among the Indians. Other factors are at work too. The arrival of cheap transistor radios has brought to an end the Indians' centuries-old isolation. Guatemala bears the hallmarks of a country fit for a full-scale guerrilla insurgency. Guatemala City, the capital, has all the stark third-world contrasts between rich and poor. The top 2% of the population is estimated to enjoy some 25% of the national income. The houses of the elite occupy the hilly suburbs. On the valley floor, the children of the slums play soccer. This is the El Limon quarter of Guatemala City. Most of the people here are peasants. They fled to the city after massive earthquakes in 1976 destroyed their villages. A million people were made homeless in this catastrophe from which Guatemala still hasn't recovered. Most of these slum dwellers are Indian. They're among the 50% of the population who receive only 10 to 15% of the national income. Slums like El Limon are the breeding ground for urban terrorism. If this were linked to the rural guerrilla movements, it could create a conflagration greater than that in El Salvador. 
¿Cómo es un botín para acá? ¿Por cualquier Por cualquier tema. Cámara. To Guatemala's increasing unrest, President Garcia has applied stern medicine. He took office in July 1978, pledging to restore peace. But the level of violence from both left and right wing groups has increased. The president has been accused of being involved with the activities of several right-wing paramilitary units. These units have launched an assassination campaign against the center and the left. To counter claims of repression, President Garcia has launched a number of social programs. Here he outlines the results of a literacy campaign. <laughs> The literacy drive has been a pet project of the president. He claims that over 400,000 people have been involved in the drive in its first six months. Proof, the president claims, of his regime's reformist intentions. In the past few months, President Garcia has also made several forays into the countryside. These occasions are used to meet the people and point to the projects the government is financing. Everywhere, security measures are obvious and elaborate. The president is always aware that the tenure of Central American leaders can be short and bloody. On this occasion, President Garcia has flown into Esquintla, 50 miles south of the capital. Because of increasing guerrilla activity in the countryside, the whole area has been sealed off. Last year, the president was seriously embarrassed by the revelation that his Minister of the Interior had secretly been a member of the Army of the Poor for four years. His vice president also resigned because of right-wing terrorism and repression of Indians. With dissension within his own cabinet, the president may be aware that the social showpieces like this hospital may be too little, too late. However, the Guatemalan military and ruling elite still appear to believe that dissension can be stamped out by increased repression. Everywhere in Latin America, the Catholic Church is an essential part of the pattern, and Guatemala is no exception. From high officials to peasants, the vast majority of Guatemalans are fervent Catholics. But the church itself is not united. The country's social and political tensions have divided it into two. On one hand, the church hierarchy, who generally support the government, and on the other hand, a growing number of priests who sympathize with the aims, if not the methods, of the guerrillas. Some of those priests have paid with their lives. For whatever the spiritual influence of the church, real power in Guatemala lies elsewhere. Guatemala's security forces are well-armed, well-trained, and feared. Apart from the army, there are several military-style police forces, and all of them, it's alleged, are involved in human rights violations of some kind or another. This is the power that's kept the government in office throughout years of increasing guerrilla opposition. Intimidation of peasants, assassination of labor leaders, and the maintenance of a general atmosphere of fear and terror. Such are the allegations laid against them by human rights workers. The security forces deny the allegations, but they do admit they're tough because they say they have to be. Guatemalan guerrillas first hit the world headlines back in the early 70s 
for the kidnapping of West German ambassador Count von Spretti. Since then, there have been numerous kidnappings and other guerrilla coups. Their exploits have served as models for others. This hostage drama three years ago was staged by factory workers demanding better conditions from the Swiss-owned company that employed them. Over the years, there's been a steady stream of incidents where ordinary Guatemalans, not guerrillas, showed their hostility to the government. This riot, again three years ago, began when students and workers objected to government plans to increase bus fares in Guatemala City. It was put down with such ferocity that eight people were killed and 150 injured. Police brutality or law and order. The government insists it's dealing with criminals and subversives, but many international observers disagree. Amnesty International, the international human rights watchdog, has compiled a report that makes many serious charges. It claims that in the three years since General Garcia came to power, nearly 5,000 Guatemalans have been seized without warrant and killed. Several hundred more have been assassinated after being branded as subversives. The government admits that assassinations take place, but blames right-wing death squads over which it has no control. Amnesty, however, claims that many of the killings originate in secret offices in an annex of Guatemala's National Palace, under the direct control of the President of the Republic. However true those allegations, it's undeniable that Guatemala's president does have the kind of power that puts the country's democratically elected Congress very much in the shade. The United States keeps a close watch on Guatemala. The Reagan administration is worried by increasing guerrilla activity against President Lucas Garcia from a united left. But the Americans do not support Guatemala on all issues. For example, Belize, the former British colony which was granted independence in September. The Americans do not support Guatemalan claims to the territory. And as long as Belize remains free from Cuban influence, its newly won independence will be given American blessing. The Guatemalans have closed the border with Belize in protest at Belizean independence, which they refuse to recognize. The Guatemalans base their claims to part or all of Belize on events long ago when the Spanish Empire broke up. The military leadership is also concerned that when the British leave Belize, the communist-backed guerrillas might find safe havens across the border. For the time being, however, British troops have been asked to remain in Belize in support of the fledgling Belize Defence Force in case a military threat from Guatemala materialises. Guatemala, of course, says it bears no hostility towards the people of Belize, the, the as Foreign Minister Rafael Castillo Valdez explains. Yes, according to our constitution, not only the Belizeans, but all of the Central American inhabitants are considered as Guatemalans. All they have to say is that they will take residence in Guatemala and that they would like to be Guatemalans, and our laws provide for that. Now, am I right in thinking that you would rather that the British stayed there for the time being until an agreement is reached, rather than give independence right away? I do not know why you understand that, because I have mentioned nothing in that regard. So, as far as you're concerned, you As far as I'm concerned, as a Guatemalan, the problems of these territories will begin to have a solution when all foreigners will go back to wherever they belong. Yeah. Uh, we feel that um, the British came here several centuries ago. I think that the only good thing about this happening is that they will go back. And I surely hope that they will go back and try to solve the problems of Ireland, the problems of Liverpool, the problems of London, Manchester, and whatever. Finally, <laughs> Minister, will you invade Belize? <clears throat> we are not savages. We want to make it very clear. The, we are a straight descendants from the Mayans, and we are so proud to say that Mayans 
were never killers, never butchers, never invaders. I think that uh, you know as much as we know about where we come from. And uh, we believe that through peace we can build what uh, you have seen in Guatemala that we have been building. How then do you and, uh, see the future in Belize? <clears throat> I think that that is mainly for the Belizeans to see what future they can, uh, they can work out. For what um, respects to Guatemala, the Belizean people represents only 2% of the Guatemalan population. And uh, they have a good number of problems which uh, I'm sure that the Belizeans have not created. I would say that the responsible for that territory, who has been because of these acts of invasion, who has been the British Empire, the problem that may be there may be because the British were there. No. Let, me, let me say that uh, whatever you may see in Guatemala, which is uh, worthwhile, looking at and admiring at has been done either by nature or by the Guatemalans. That the British have, the British or the Americans or the Russians or any foreigner, including the Spaniards, have done very little for these peoples. And um, we Guatemalans feel very uh, strongly that the only way that a small nation like ours would have uh, an opportunity to grow in the way that we have been growing, is if we have a chance to do things by ourselves. Doing things by themselves isn't the kind of policy that's going to give much reassurance either to the Belizeans or to the Americans. If it means Guatemala will continue its territorial claims on Belize, then the future certainly does look unsettled. There are other reasons for worry. Despite the wide publicity that's been given to the charges over human rights, most of Guatemala's middle classes are solidly behind the government. And with that kind of backing, plus the admittedly guarded support of Washington, the government just doesn't see why it should make any serious concessions to its opponents. Changes needed are, in fact, less than have already taken place in Nicaragua or are expected in El Salvador. The essentials are protection of one, one, land grabbers, more breathing room for the moderate chat, one, two, one, two. I am. and a halt All right. to government inspired. So I think I'll pause this real quick. I already shared the link the in chat. It's the Guatemala days. report, which is on the AP Archive YouTube channel if you want to uh, look at that in your own time. So, Pat, how are you? How are you feeling today? Guatemala wrong on that thing. Did no. you really? No, no. That's that's right. Sometimes I get tripped up on it myself. What's good, Hashkush? How you doing, Hashkush? How was everybody today? We feeling good? Second day in a row of uh, subversive history. Yeah. Wow. Can you believe it? I'm exhausted. <laughs> Hello. Has, has in a bookshelf. Oh. Oh, Red Wizard. Hello, hello. How is everybody? Uh, so yeah, we uh we got a very, very busy week. Um, you know, uh we had yesterday, we're doing today, we're gonna do uh we're gonna we're gonna do kinda like what we did with Korea in that uh, you know, Guatemala is another topic of great interest to Pat and he has uh, read probably more books about Guatemala than he has even Korea. And luckily, Blowback has not done an episode on Guatemala yet. They will. They will. They will. Uh, I'm sure of it. It's a heavy stack. But this time we're beating them to the punch. Um, you know, and then uh, tomorrow we're going to be recording an episode of the Work Stoppage podcast. We're going to be guesting on there. So I think it's, uh, some point. it's like what? Exclamation point. Uh, stoppage. Is that it? No. <laughs> no. All right. I don't. I forget what the alert is for that, but they're working on it right now. <laughs> um. So yeah, we're gonna be we're gonna be working on that uh, tomorrow, and then um, we are in talks with Cena from uh, the East as a podcast. 
Uh, we're gonna. That's why we're skipping over the chapter for Iran for right now. Uh, if you know you're following along in the book, which I'm sure you all are, um, you know we're gonna go over that with him, uh, as he is Iranian diaspora uh, and is very well educated on the history of Iran uh, and its conflicts with the U.S. Uh, or like the West at large, because uh, you know we'll get into it. Um, and then, uh, we also, this Wednesday, are doing an episode on Peru with our very own, uh, Sebsdev, and, uh, later on, uh, either, I think, maybe over the weekend or sometime during the week, we're gonna do an episode that's gonna be a panel discussion with Rick and, uh, Plants Fanon from Decolonized Buffalo, along with, uh, Red Falcon. If you're familiar with all of those people, uh, we're going to be doing a panel uh, that is going to discuss at length, would Lenin, would Stalin support decolonization? And uh, I think it'll be a very interesting conversation that is ultimately going to uh, just fucking thoroughly dismantle the Pat Sock uh, argument and movement, in my opinion. Yeah, it's going to yeah, be a wow. busy week. <laughs> we have a lot of balls up in the air, folks. Um, it's very exciting. We're happy to be engaging in a lot of projects. And we're also very happy that um, our peers and predecessors on this platform and other platforms have interest in um, having the two very silly individuals before you uh, discuss really any topic. So all of it is very exciting. And uh, I suppose we couldn't do it without your support. So thank you for your continued support. Speaking of support... Um, you may notice at the bottom right corner of the stream, there is a donate to charity link. Um, for the next month and maybe longer, I will be working directly with the books through Bar's uh, location of Philadelphia, which is a charity which uh, supports um, incarcerated individuals uh, getting books free of charge. Obviously, we are a... Um, bibliophilic stream here um who also have very uh you know socially conscious views towards the prison industrial con con complex and mass incarceration so um i will be volunteering directly with that organization as well as trying to raise money for them <laughs> excuse me as well as trying to uh raise money for them over the next month or so so if any of you uh would f are feeling generous whatsoever if you could just um throw a dollar or however much that you feel comfortable with into that donate to charity link, it will go to a very good cause. Yep. And they are located uh, right in Philly. Uh, they are an all volunteer nonprofit organization that believe in systematic social, educational and economic uh, inequality it leads to relentless cycles of crime and mass incarceration and their work and the work that Pat will be doing with them aims to reverse the devastating effects that, injustice and incarceration has on individuals families and communities so if you can find it in your hearts to donate you know even just a dollar uh you know or whatever you can uh you know uh, please please do please please please. So, please 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 so uh without further ado we are subversive history a multimedia community project seeking to bring attention to the revolutionary struggles of the world's often unsung and frequently misunderstood sectors these are the stories of the demonized vilified whitewashed or otherwise forgotten campaigns against imperialism colonialism capitalist exploitation and racial apartheid the orthodoxy of western hegemony has often labeled these dissidents as subversive and these are the struggles that we aim to illuminate and uh, this is actually also pretty interesting because I think it was your uh, research on Guatemala that led to uh, even the namesake of our uh, our little stream here. The namesake of our little stream. That is absolutely correct. Um, so the, the term subversive Subversivos. history... Um, when I was researching, uh, my, when, I, when I was in Guatemala for, uh, I spent six weeks in Guatemala in uh, 2021. Um, and when I was reading my books about a project that I hoped to produce on Guatemala, I noticed the term subversive come up um, quite frequently in the uh, repressive uh, fascistic dictatorship of the US sponsored Jorge Ubico. Um, and that was the first time where I got it in my head like, oh, subversive is a 
pretty cool name because that's pretty much subversive was a term that was um, synonymous with communist, essentially. Uh, subversive literature would be essentially communist literature. Those proliferating subversive ideas um, uh, would be those generally considered um, those proliferating communist ideas. So that's where I got that inspiration from uh, for the name of this channel and page. It started out as a Facebook page that I made. Now it's evolved into a much more uh, consistent uh, Twitch stream that we've been doing here thanks to uh, my beloved friend Johnny. Um, hey, I try. So, um, and that's why it's called Guatemalan history. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, you know, this was, if, if anyone was here for the, the, the Korea presentation that I did, um, this is something very similar to that um, because this, uh, the book that we're currently reading, Killing Hope by William Blum, has a section on Guatemala um, pretty much uh, centered around the coup that took place in 1953, 1954. Um, <clears throat> and I've written about this subject a little bit. And... Um, I've written, I've written about this subject a little bit. So I wanted to kind of do the same thing we did with Korea, where we kind of open up my more, um, more in depth introduction to the topic. And then we allow William Blum to pick it up when the coup, the coup really kicks in the most infamous part of this whole thing. And the, the topic of Guatemala is one that you could probably do something like blowback on because of the, uh, length of time that it really spans, because just going off of this, I, I think I put together about 80 slides here, just talking about the time period leading up to, um, the coup and then the coup in itself could be an entire project. And then, I mean, the Guatemalan civil war or the genocide, depending on, you know, how you want to classify it is another roughly 40 years of, um, of discussion to be had and then even from the 90s even after the end of the civil war we have you know the mining companies um oh, Ross. We, we, the mining companies the canadian mining companies the, the issues that the indigenous people are still having there so guatemala is like an endless uh subject that i could really get into um right. so i'm happy to be able to talk about that a little bit i think Farce is a like... great word it's also a great ep by uh rudimentary penai I think like any of the topics that we cover so far, um, and namely like w just our, our interest in, in history, right? Uh, you can only cover so much, but all of these issues, right, are interrelated and they have such like a site of, of construction, right, that reaches so far back that like, you know, you truly cannot just, uh, you know, look at like, you know, one simple event, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you know, the, the history of the 20th century is a history that is largely defined by the cold war. Right. Uh, in my opinion, it's probably the most, you know, uh, other than world war two, um, you know, world war two being relatively short in the span compared to, um, you know, world war, I mean, uh, the cold war, you right. know what I mean? The, the world that we live in today is so largely constructed by the cold war right. that going through these issues is, um, so relevant for understanding, you know, the hegemonic world that we kind of exist in, the way that media presents itself, the way that politics, the realm of politics has contoured itself to fit a specific narrative. I mean, all of these things can be, you know, you, you can, there's a through line through from World War II through the Cold War right. of how our current reality and, is constructed. And World War II has a through line directly to World War One. World War One, you can go back to the, the various uprisings and revolutions that, like, you know, happened throughout Europe. You can go back to, like, the fucking enclosure of the commons, right? Um, or the rise of the Vatican. And, like, you know, you're you're going back further and further, and it's just, like, all of these things are just, like, a slow, you know, progression mm -hmm. to uh, all of this. But before we get, go, you know, too crazy, um, Selena and Savage, but thank you, Sam. Uh, let's see, Guatemala, the force of independence. Do you want to start this off? Yeah, sure. So just so that you know the, the, the kind of context for, for what, uh, the, the way that I wrote this this way, because I'm going to bring you on the same journey that I was, or the journey that the way that I typed this out. So on um, September 15th of 2021, um, I was in Guatemala and I was present at the, um, uh, the, the palace in Guatemala City. Um, where I witnessed a number of protests um, on Guatemalan Independence Day. 
So that experience, as well as some like the pictures and footage that I took from there is kind of what the, you know, bases like the, the, the theme of this essay that I wrote or, or the script or whatever you want to refer to it as. So just keep that in mind. Can you go oh, back? Sh sorry, sorry, sorry. That was completely accidental. Okay. So September 15th, 2021 marked the 200th anniversary of Guatemala's national independence. A country's Independence Day is typically associated with exuberant displays of patriotism, patriotism and reverence for a nation's collective history. Yet during Guatemala's bicentennial quote-unquote celebration, the National Palace of Guatemala was adorned with dissident graffiti, blood-soaked Guatemalan flags, and banners depicting slogans such as 200 years of shit and independence for who. What was at the root of this resentment expressed so emphatically at the Guatemalan capital? For what purpose would a populace reject their own country's national independence? Um, September 2001. Oh, right. Okay. Um, so, um, you know, this was kind of like the, what I felt, you know, because in the United States, obviously there's like a very, you know, the popular sentiment is very, 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 you know, celebratory for the na nation's independence. Right. Uh, you know, I think most countries have this kind of, uh, celebration. But when I was in Guatemala, there was far more protest than there were celebrations. So that's kind of like the, the beginning question to, to kind of lead this whole thing off. Like why, uh, why would, um, this country or the, you know, I'm in the capital city at the, at the capital. So why was there such a scorn population that was so discontent, um, regarding this? Let me just fix one thing real quick. Just give me, give me that put that right exactly there, right that right there and perfect okay all right is this a video no 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 this is just some stuff that i snipped because i didn't okay. want to so this is just a snippet this was me at the um the, the guatemalan capital and as you can see no no this was kind of just a wider shot to see the crowd but go forward um, this is the same picture, but just with a close up. Um, these are some of the demonstrations. These are the people that they had up on the stage that were leading the demonstration. So you can see that the demonstration was indigenous in nature. Uh, it was a, it was a demonstration of the indigenous of Guatemala. And um, you know, we'll, we will be getting into why that is such a relevant issue um, <clears throat> in Guatemala throughout history and in Guatemala Guatemalan politics today. So you can go forward a little bit. Um, there's the blood soaked flag that was being waved. Um, I think the next one is actually, um, a queer demonstration that they had. If you go forward and look a dove. <laughs> oh, wow. Is it really? I it's think made... so. I mean, yeah, what so other bird would be there? The people who had the blood soaked flag in the middle of everyone. Uh, this is actually a queer demonstration, um, of them, like kind of like dancing on the flag. Um, if you go forward. And then they covered themselves with, uh, you know, you know, to make, you know, appear to appear as being dead, uh, to represent the murders, uh, the political murders throughout Guatemala's history. <clears throat> I can go forward. There's one of the bicentennial bicentenario de Merda, 200 years of shit effectively. Uh, here's another group of, um, queer demonstrators, um, at the Capitol. These are all pictures I took, by the way. I didn't know. I don't know if I put that out there, but this is all uh, footage that I grabbed myself while I was present at this demonstration. Look at Pat being uh, such a good ally. Here's some of the street. Here's some of the. <laughs> here's some of the street art. Uh, Two hundred years of exploitation and corruption of the oligarchy. Um, this was uh, posted up on the walls around the. Um, this isn't even all there's there's graffiti I, I i actually filmed people actually putting up graffiti there was only so much that i could get for this so maybe one day we can look at more of that um more of that information sam he, don't don't ever let him play it down this dude has zero problems going to another just hopping on a plane going to another country not knowing any other language than english <laughs> Right. And also, I mean, hey, if you want us to go to Vietnam, we have a 1,000 sub, uh, <laughs> 1, sub goal that once it's met, we will go to Vietnam and stream. So if you're interested in sending these two pale faces to Vietnam, feel free to give some subs. See, Pat would probably go to Vietnam not knowing anybody, not knowing anything. Uh, meanwhile, I'm I'm probably going to be the one to be like, Luna, can you please tell us what's a good area to stay in? Yeah, I mean, that's what I did in India. 
True. I mean, my media thing was completely solo, and I figured it out as I got there. Uh, here's me, just to prove that I was actually there. <laughs> um, here's a picture of me with more street art that says there was genocide, um, referring to the genocide of the Mayan population that occurred throughout the Guatemalan Civil War and has kind of been occurring for, throughout the entire um, colonial and modern history of Guatemala. Right, so it just, it just hasn't stopped. And here's one more, uh, this isn't any of the protest footage, but here's me meeting with uh, several indigenous activists who I sat down and I interviewed. I have all this footage. It's gonna take a lot of like editing and translation and subtitling, things that I don't really have time or money to do, but I hope um, I hope I can. Uh, this is me with uh, you know a couple, a couple people who I got in touch with here that were gracious enough to give me interviews um, from their time being in uh, the man on the right. Uh, his name is Luis. He was part of the student activist groups throughout the, um, throughout the Civil War, and um, the man in the middle was actually a uh, ex-guerrilla. He was a guerrilla during the Civil War. Also, HTA, yes, I too am also suffering from all kinds of agoraphobia. So yeah, so there's uh, there's me and me and my buddies. With your sick disrupt shirt. Yeah. So the, if you want to. Yeah. The independence achieved from formal colonial subjugation existed only nominally for much of the Guatemalan population. The oppressive apparatus once commanded by the Spanish crown was merely supplanted by an equally oppressive minority of European-blooded landowners. Following the independent status acquired in 1821, Guatemala would endure decades of forced labor practices, a procession of dictators beholden to foreign economic interests, and a government which routinely engaged in draconian forms of repression. Just as during Spanish colonial rule, Guatemala's indigenous population would bear the brunt of these systems of abuse and exploitation. It is my intention to provide the historical context, which dispels the farcical illusion of independence and validates the discontent expressed by the citizens of Guatemala City on September 21st, 2021. So um, that's kind of like, so this is like a really important like situation here because I feel like for me personally, as someone from the West, someone from the United States, this idea of national identity is... Um, it's very simplistic the way that we understand it. And I think that you're going to hear this with a lot of our discussions with Rick um, from Decolonized Buffalo as we kind of talk about the difference. We're like, there is a nationality called Mexican. There is a nationality called Guatemalan. Right. But there, th that does not mean that there is a monolithic um identity group of mexicans or a monolithic identity group of right. guatemalans right so like was guatemala independent in 1821 technically yes uh you know it was no longer feeding the mother country of spain in 1821 but what was it effectively? Um, those who are the indigenous of guatemala who are the mayan were still facing the same um repression under the same uh people effectively that were just no longer serving a mother country it was still european blooded elites that were technically guatemalan they were never they were never born they weren't born in europe they were never right. outside of they were born and lived in guatemala their whole life they qualify as a guatemalan through and through but they are not indigenous they are not necessarily a minority group they are a the, the descendants of colonists who retained a power structure from the colonial times. So this is like, did you understand what I'm kind of saying here, yeah, Johnny? No, no, I, I, I think the perception of Guatem of of this identity of Latin America specifically in in like a compare or contrasting, you know, uh, way like America in that, you know, once it was no longer an English, co come on, man. What you, what happened to your camera? I do not know. Well, a uh, little bit of technical issue here, uh, everyone. Come on, man. Don't do not do this to me now. Please run camera. Come on, man. You gotta be fucking kidding me, right? Use virtual camera. I don't know, it's, it's backwards, so it's hard for me to read. I'm trying to read it backwards. I don't um, know. What is going Hang on one second. Fucking Jesus Christ. Sebs. 
Uh, Matron's Militia, that's exactly right. A settler colony having a bourgeois revolution sounds familiar. That's exactly, um, this reading about Guatemala completely changed my perspective on the American Revolution also, because what you have is just a bunch of like um, British people, the the, the, the ascendants of Anglo-Saxons, the, the, the descendants of um, uh, Europeans, who, you know, for those that are the native populations or the, you know, slave populations that were brought over, there was no difference in independence. Independence changed absolutely nothing to their in, to their uh, repression. If anything, it made it worse in many circumstances, including like in Guatemala. Right. So, so my comparison was like to the U.S., much like how we were learning in Gerald Horn's book, 1776, The Counter-Revolution. Right. I will always be citing Gerald Horn. I think he's probably one of the greatest historians of our time. But uh, I think that in much the same way that once, you know, the colonies were free and no longer an English colony, uh, it's not as if things improved drastically for people that were already marginalized and in that like construction of a racial hierarchy, right? It's not like the Irish suddenly were like, you know, um, <laughs> no longer uh, 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 looked down upon or Catholics or the black African slaves that, you know, uh, especially, like, were not suddenly, like, you know, uh, free or anything, you know, they, they weren't doing any better once they were no longer under an English colony, it's not like indigenous people, especially, if anything, things uh, got worse for them, you know what I mean? But yeah. I think that the construction of, like, Guatemala and, you know, the U.S. are a little different in that, like, their colonial mother country like spain for guatemala england for america england didn't want the u.s to expand any further because it would be harder to manage you know what i mean it's a lot more slaves to try and keep track of it's a lot more like you know people to try and keep track of whereas with spain and guatemala i feel like it's a little bit more like you know no we want the entire thing that's more you know in, uh indigenous people for us to subjugate Right. And that's an important thing here as well. Uh, I, I'm not sure if this is the correct time to bring this up or not, but I will. Um, you know, the, the, the black population of Guatemala is virtually, uh, no, I wouldn't say non-existent, but it's very, 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 like compared to some places like Brazil, places like Cuba, um, places like Haiti. Pla like So in, in Guatemala, there's Belize, which was part of Guatemala for a long time, but is was, um, you know, kind of like, partitioned off as like a British colony, I, I assume, I apologize for that, but you will see like a, a, a significant amount of um, African descendant people in Belize and even on the Eastern coast of Guatemala, um, which is the coast that, you know, faced the sea that was closest to Africa where it was um, lucrative to bring slaves. But for most of Guatemala, where um, Guatemala is a little bit different than some other Latin American countries, they said, well, what do we need to bring ship slaves here for? We have plenty of indigenous people here that we can just enslave. Right. So instead of having to like, you know, import all these slaves from Africa, they, for the most part, um, uh, subjugated the Mayan population to be the slaves. And if you read uh, Rogoberto Menchu's um, book, um, you know, even she worked as like servants. She would go to the urban centers to work as a servant, um, you know, in the rich people's homes. Right. All right. So next one. Yes. So this is a great uh, quote here that I feel like kind of uh, uh, describes this here dynamic. Um, and it is by uh, a great writer um, who wrote what I consider uh, to be mandatory reading uh, for leftist history, which is The Open Veins of Latin America. Um, definitely pick this book up. And hey, I'll, I'll agree with Hugo Chavez, who says this book is a monument in our Latin American history. So uh, that's, uh, that's Chavez's opinion on it. So if you haven't read that one yet, I, I consider it a must read. Um, maybe so, we'll read it one day on stream. That would be great. But um, Correct me if I'm wrong. That's the book that um, oftentimes gets compared to as like the, the better book to read over like, what is it? Like Guns, Germs, and Steel, right? Probably. I, I don't know much about Guns, Germs, and Steel, but I know it's pretty, it's like lib, right? Yeah. It like it like makes the argument that like you know oh well the indigenous people were just uh, technologically inferior therefore like mm -hmm. you know it was gonna happen right yeah exactly I would definitely say that this is a a very very far superior alternative 
Um, so here is uh, Edward Gali Eduardo Galliano. He says, it was the dispossessed of Latin America who with spears and machetes really fought against Spanish power at the dawn of the 19th century. Independence did not reward them. It betrayed the hopes of those who had shed their blood. Peace came and with it a new era of daily misery. Landowners and businessmen increased their fortunes while poverty grew among the masses. The intrigues of Latin America's new masters grew, and the four viceroyalties of the Spanish Empire blew up and gave birth to many new nations. So uh, what, what Eduardo Galeano is saying here, just so eloquently, like more eloquently than I could ever have said in the, these 40 pages or so that I've written for this, um, what is summed up here in terms of the farcical illusion of independence that countries like Guatemala experienced in the liberal revolutions that broke them away from their colonial mother countries. Um, you know, it was the dispossessed who really fought against Spanish power with spears and machetes, saying that, you know, the, 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 the rich liberal European landowners, those are not the ones that fought against Spanish power. They merely assumed the power position. It was the indigenous and the native populations of Central America and South America who really fought against Spanish power. Right. Uh, independence did not reward them. So this this 1821 independence was not some kind of like a windfall for uh, the indigenous populations. It betrayed hopes of those who had shed their blood. Peace came. Peace in the terms of this like European dominated settler colonial relationship in terms in, in geopolitics, but with it a new era of daily misery for the indigenous population. Landowners and businessmen increased their fortune, but poverty grew among the masses. In Guatemala, the masses at this point were the indigenous people. Um, the intrigues of the of Latin America's new masters grew, and the four vice royalties, meaning the entirety of the Spanish colonial empire, exploded and gave birth to many new nations. And that's what we see here. Like, you know, prior to this, there was, you know, prior to this, and maybe if you go forward, maybe it's the next slide. That would be really convenient for me. Okay, it is. So like, like I said, there was no Guatemala prior to this. Right. The Mayan empire... In, it encompassed all of Guatemala, all of Belize, a good portion of Mexico, including Chiapas, uh, I guess a small portion of El Salvador. So, um, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, the identity of a Guatemalan never existed. Even here, the original name of the Guatemala is not even a Mayan term. It was actually from the Nahuatl of Mexico because when Spain first arrived, um, they arrived in Mexico or, right. you know, Say they arrived at like Hispaniola first, if you want right, to, right, right. to. I'm saying on this like kind of like mainland excursion of colonialism, they came south into Guatemala and they had Nahuatl guides helping them come down through Mexico into what would today be called Guatemala. So like it says here that it means place of many trees in the Mexican language, Nahuatl, which means that Spain named Guatemala after a Nahuatl word that to describe the area. So, um, um, are, are you laughing at what I said or was a chat? No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm laughing at like the, the, the so it's an indigenous word an from indigenous another word. place. Exactly, <laughs> to but it's not mine. Yeah, I know, it's just, you know. Um, so, it, and, and, and so it'll even say here that, um, okay, I thought it would say that. So, so for example, and this persisted, um, so in, the um the second largest city in guatemala aside from guatemala city is quetzaltenango which is the official name but when you go there most people call it shella shella is the original mayan name for that area so most people just recall it, call it shella one for authenticity and two because quetzaltenango is like so many syllables and it's so hard to learn but shella is the way that it is uh typically called by the indigenous people who live there. So just a little bit of like, this kind of describes further kind of like this, 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 this nebulous murky notion of national identity yeah. where you had a, uh, you know, a Mayan population that expanded outside of the borders pretty significantly of what is today Guatemala. And even the name Guatemala is like a bastardized kind of like, you know, not really bastardized. It's just a foreign name slapped on to the area that was convenient for the Spanish, I suppose. Right. Well, I mean, it's like uh, there are certain tribes uh, within America that, like, have names that are just literally, like, slurs used against them by, like, the French. You know what I mean? Are you comfortable giving me an example of that, or do you not even uh, I'm, I, I... Hang on. Uh, 
I was just curious if there was any that I knew. I'm trying to figure out what name it was, but I think it was like the Sue or something, oh, right? I see. That okay. like it just means like snake, right? Gotcha. And it's like you know, um, what the hell is it? A uh, like an insult to them to refer to them as like snakes. Gotcha. You know what I mean? Okay. All right, and yeah. I don't quote me on that. I could be in completely and entirely wrong. You know, it's just something I'm like mildly recalling. But yeah. you know, uh, even if you look up like the, the what is it like 23 different states in the U.S. Uh, come from indigenous words. Right. Or come from, you know, something like, like that. Like Indiana and Man. the indigenous word Indian. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> Just a little joke that I made there. All right, I think so Oklahoma go. definitely is, though. So, a um, couple of things that I want to, and, and this is going to get brought up in a second, is a couple of things that I wanted to make clear where during the colonial time there was these, a couple of uh, Spanish programs that were effectively slave programs. Um, so, the first one of those would be uh, what. I have so much trouble saying this word. I'm sorry. Requirimiento. Requirimiento. That extra I in, the, in there really messes me up. Requirimiento? So yeah, there you go. Was a declaration. My, my Anglo-Saxon tongue can't wrap around <laughs> it. Um, was a declaration of by the Spanish monarchy written by the Council of Castile, Jurist Juan Lopez de Palicios Rubios of Castile's divinely ordained right to take possession of the territories of the New World and to subjugate exploit and when necessary fight native inhabitants um requirimiento which is spanish for requirement as in demand was read to native americans to inform them of spain's rights to conquest the spaniards thus considered those who resisted as defying god's plan and so used catholic theology to justify their conquest so this is um you know one of the ways in which they were able to enslave subjugate exploit and kill native populations to expand the spanish empire Requerimiento. Re -re 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 potato. Oh, I can't even say my potato loving tongue as a as a Irish person because actually uh the potato I believe comes from Peru. And uh yes, I, I believe I was correct on the uh term Sioux due to the hypothesis among other possible theories that its origin may be a derogatory derogatory word meaning snake in the language of the Ojibwe, who are among yeah. historical enemies of the Lakota. So. Yes, I can't even blame my my oh. my potato loving tongue because uh, potatoes aren't even indigenous to uh, Ireland. Nope. <laughs> we can't even have that one. Nope. There's like all kinds of misconceptions. Um, it, it's great, especially when you go to like an Irish themed restaurant or pub, and like all of it is either Scott or English. Yeah. It's, you want to read up? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll save my, my Irish uh, culture banter for later. Encomienda. Uh, oh, look at that. It's got a little, like, encomienda. Uh, this one's way easier. Encomienda. <laughs> encomienda. I can say this one easier. Was a Spanish slave labor system that rewarded conquerors with the labor. You can tell this was written by a fucking Brit. Of conquered non-Christian peoples. The laborers, in theory, were provided with the benefits of the by the conquerors for whom they labored, including military protection and education. So it's kind of a racket. The encomienda was first established in Spain following the Christian reconquest of Moorish territories, known to Christians as the Reconquista. And I believe me and Dave, Dave, we've talked about this. And it was applied on a much larger scale during the Spanish colonization of the Americas and the Spanish Philippines. Conquered peoples were considered vassals of the Spanish monarch. The crown awarded an encomienda as a grant to a particular individual. In the conquest era of the early 16th century, the grants were considered to be a monopoly on the labor of particular groups of indigenous peoples held in perpetuity by the grant holder, called the encomiendero. Following the new laws of 1542, upon the death of the encomiendero, the encomienda ended and was replaced by the repartimiento. Uh, so these are just various forms in which the um, Spanish Empire 
effectively enslaved uh, the Mayan people who were in the area of Guatemala and in pretty much any other part of the Spanish empire that, it, that expanded past Mayan territory. Do you know what year um, the Christians reconquered the Iberian Peninsula? No. And pushed the Moors out? No, I don't. I'll, I'll give you three guesses. I, I, I'm not guessing. What is it? Okay. It's like literally like 1491. So right before they arrived in the New World. Like literally within the year after conquering the Iberian Peninsula, um, like fucking set sail into the, the, the fucking New World. Well, that makes sense. So here's a couple of random, you know, just facts that I brought up about Guatemala that is kind of interesting about Guatemala. So um, Guatemala has an indigenous community of about 40% of the population, making it, um, you know, almost a half of the population. And that's in the 21st century, I think, as of just like maybe 30, 40, 50 years ago, um, the indigenous population was the uh, the largest population in Guatemala. And then if you go to a place like Shela, which is the second largest city in Guatemala, um, indigenous is actually the majority population in many of the cities that aren't the main capital city, which is Guatemala City. And um, as you can see here, they do separate uh, indigenous from mestizo, which, you know, means that they aren't necessarily just equating every single person that may have, um, you know, some kind of blood quantum situation where, right. you know, for those of you that don't know, a mestizo is a um, person that is of mixed heritage um, of indigenous and European heritage. Right. And and just because they have that, you know, uh, indigenous heritage does not mean that, like, they're connected to that culture or those belief systems or any of that other stuff. So that's where, you know, indigeneity, um, you know, why we invite Rick on so much and why we have so many guests and why we're so interested in having so many guests on. Um, that are indigenous and to speak about indigeneity right in that manner um you know it's because it's it's not as simple as like oh well you know you're uh zela and um you know of course you you must know everything about like you know zela culture you know and practice like x y and z beliefs like no my mom just you know happens to be zela and like you know we, we practice catholicism you know what i mean is zela uh a uh or no, I'm sorry. I, like I, I looked at that and was just looked at Shella, like the first word. Uh, Shella, Shella, Shella. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, so uh, but that's why I ma made that point specifically is because of conversations that I had with Rick, yeah. and it led me to believe that maybe in this polling they may have been more stringent than just being like you have indigenous blood in you. It seems like they at least made some effort to separate the indigenous population from the mestizo population. Right. So I think, and I think that has a little bit more. Um, merit to it than just being like right. oh you're one eighth you're one eighth indigenous mayan so now you're right like, like for instance me being anglo indian right my father just happens to be anglo indian does that mean that like you know my dad knows everything about like anglo indian culture or like you know is even familiar with like you know the beliefs of hinduism right you know or or any of the other like no. Now, could you ask, could you ask Johnny's dad where to get a good slice of pizza in Hell yeah. side of Jersey? If you, you can ask my dad, like, what's your favorite Pantera album? He has an answer for you. <laughs> if you. If you ask my dad what his favorite Bollywood movie is, right? Um, he's going to be like, I don't watch that shit. If you ask yeah. my dad, you know, like, okay, well, what's your favorite sci-fi movie? He's probably going to answer with like Blade Runner. You know, like it's it, 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 it just because you are does not mean that, like you're connected to like the larger exactly. culture and community, you know, exactly. All right, good. Um, and here's another statistic here. Data from recent years show that poverty rate among the indigenous people in Guatemala is at 79 percent, almost 30 points above the national average. Uh, even before the COVID-19 pandemic, eight out of every 10 indigenous girls, boys and ados adolescents live in poverty. So to this very day. Uh, the indigenous, which, as we had already established, is a major, major, major significant portion of Guatemala's population. The majority population. of the population. Yeah, yeah exactly. Are, um, are living in poverty, in intense poverty. Um, so this is not something that 
was alleviated through independence. It's not something that was alleviated through the revolution. It's not something that was alleviated through the civil war. It's not something that was alleviated through the peace accords that were made in the nineties. And it's not something that has been made. Um, it's not something that has been remedied through like, let's just say like the past few decades of like IMF, NAFTA, uh, economic interventions. No, if uh, anything, none of those could... things have alleviated the impoverished existence that has been enforced upon the Mayan population in Guatemala since the 1500s that the Spanish arrived. Yo, what's up, Vic? I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna hit the bathroom yeah, real quick. Yeah, go I'll for it. Yeah. Do you want me to go into the next slide? No, just just just. All right, all right. You got it. You got it. What's going on, Vic? How you doing? I'm very, very excited about like the uh, the upcoming panel. I, I hope that Rick has uh, reached out to you. It's gonna be it's gonna be a very interesting one, and hopefully we figure out a way to get like you know five different people uh, not to talk over one another. <laughs> we can figure something out. Um, but yeah, this um, I'm making spaghetti Monday. Yeah, I'm there. <laughs> um. What the fuck is it? Um, so, you know, back to talking about, like, just because you are of a particular background does not mean that you are necessarily affiliated with, like, the larger, you know, community of people, right? A lot of times people, you know, already get confused when I say that, like, I'm Indian, so now I have to be more specific that, like, I'm Anglo-Indian, right? And on top of that, like, you know, I think, like, when you specify it to, like, Anglo-Indian, a lot of people are just going to be like, all right. Well, yeah, exactly. Well, I don't, I don't even have any assumptions about that, but it was funny when I was like, you know, vegetarian that people a lot of times would assume like, Oh, oh it's because you're Hindu. Yeah. It's Hindu. cause you're Hindu. Right. And I'm like, no, my like which whole thing, funny, which is another funny thing about that is cause I spent four weeks in Kerala where Hinduism is not even like the most prominent religious sect in Kerala. Right. And like vegetarianism is like way less common in, in, in Kerala than it is in other more like, pronounced hindu parts of india so like even like that is like a kind of insensitive uh you know right. assumption about people from india right also. And, and the fact that there's like literal thousands of different sects of hinduism like right. people like they don't have a hard time you know wrapping their heads around like oh well there's lutheran uh catholic yeah. you know Methodist, Methodist baptist or any of this other shit but it's just like when you bring up like islam or you bring up like hinduism or something <laughs> yeah. like especially islam because it's like literally part of the abrahamic like you know trinity right yeah. or like you bring up like the fact that like hinduism right you know has like they, they always like to say oh they have many gods and it's like no they just kind of have like different names for like the same fucking thing you know um, or that like, you know, uh, what, what the hell is it? That Hinduism isn't like the only religion practice there. Yeah. They, they on some like Brown equals Brown. You exactly. Know. Yeah. And, uh, Red Falcon also, uh, that tracks pretty much all over the globe. Yeah. I noticed that a lot of times when you look at like poverty statistics in the United States, um, it'll say that, um, uh, the black population in the United States has the highest rate of poverty, but then it has to have an asterisk under it. That's like <laughs> actually except for native Americans, right. but like we don't even consider them statistically significant enough to like give them the number one spot is kind of like the way that a lot of those statistics are put together, which is really uh, interesting to me. But yeah, that tracks, you know, whether it's in the United States or in Guatemala, but the only difference is in Guatemala, Guatemala has retained a significant, a, a far greater portion uh, percentage of its in the, uh, the Mayan population Which in the United States. It's equally shocking because, correct me if I'm wrong, chat, but I think there's like literally like more indigenous people in the U.S. than there are Jewish people in the U.S. That blows my, that blows me away. <laughs> maybe that's just because I'm from New Jersey. Yeah, right. Where like, you know, you know, maybe there's, a, I'm probably not taking into the consideration that like outside of like New York, Jersey, Philly, there's probably a ton right. of the United States that doesn't have the Jewish population yeah. that I'm used to going to high school with. Yeah. There's probably a lot of the U S is like, no, nah, we don't have, <laughs> we don't have a synagogue here. Yeah. <laughs> we got the one church, the one that's yeah. allowed. <laughs> All right. You want to read this one? I, sure. I read a couple of those studies. Yeah, okay. yeah. So, to begin understanding the frustration expressed by the Guatemalan people, one, 
must first comprehend the farcical notion of independence, which they protested. Guatemala's national independence was achieved on September 21st, 1821, following three centuries of colonial subjugation, which dismantled the indigenous society which preceded it. Spain would conscript the native population to a slave status through coercive labor programs, such as requerimiento and encomienda. As the centuries of colonial rule progressed, generations of Guatemalan-born Spaniards developed within the colony, and by the 19th century, the descendants of the conquistadors, known as criollo, or would it be like criollo? Criollo. Criollo. European-blooded, but born in the colony, as opposed to in Spain itself, would begin a campaign to transition themselves into power untethered by the Spanish crown. This process would culminate in Guatemala's national independence in 1821. So yeah, so this is, uh, you know, kind of further just elaborating on that tr that trends, uh, that progression towards independence work. So imagine that it's the 1500s and Spain first lands over here, starts developing the community, starts conquering the land, uh, you know, putting themselves in power maybe 100 years goes by, maybe 200 years goes by, maybe 300 years goes by, as happened, and eventually you have people living there, Spanish-blooded people, European-blooded people, that have been there for generations, that have never even seen Spain, and eventually they're like, why the fuck are we even being controlled by Spain? Right. Like, and eventually in a similar way that happened in the United States where like, you know, a lot of it was like, you know, European people that were the settlers that were like, no, fuck fuck britain you know what i mean like you know they want us to do all this other stuff they want to do that just fuck them we're independent now right and uh so that's also the uh, the the situation that presented itself in guatemala i literally had like a two hour long conversation with my wife because uh you know she's on the the pedro pascal fever right yeah. um about like because we were watching narcos right uh and i was trying to explain to her she because she was like wait so you're telling me that like that guy that's like playing the the former president he's white and i'm like white. yes he is white within yeah. with within you know colombia yes he is white when he comes yeah. to america well do you mean chile or no 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 it would be no 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 not pedro pascal specifically oh, we're talking we're talking about like a character within the show narcos because it takes oh, place okay. in colombia right um it's like the first or second season right she's telling me that like so you're telling me that like the former president of you know colombia that, that no matter what the actor is but like the person that he is portraying would be considered white in colombia and i'm like yes in colombia have white privilege also yes in colombia right in, in guatemala they call them white amalans right in guatemala but when they come to the u.s well, that's subject to change depends you know what how much money does he have what kind of like you know influence how much of an, how much how of an, an accent, accent you know have? what part yeah. of the u.s he's in you know like it it it, it like the the construction of race and that racial hierarchy was constructed yes Louis yes ck is a mexican man yes tom, like that, tom segura is is <laughs> spanish <laughs> he's peruvian eh? is he really peruvian his, his lineage is Peruvian. Wow. So, but, you know. Yeah, so that's Destiny is Cuban. Yes. Which is not surprising. Right. But, um, you know, this is just the thing. This is part of this conversation that we have to have to kind of break down this monolithic idea that people in the United States have about Latin American countries. It's most important in Latin America because they are, like the United States, a, uh, you know, successfully maintained settler colonial empire. Um, and it, 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 it makes the, the idea of ethnicity so much more complex. Yes. Like, like Halsey. Do you know who Halsey is, Pat? I've heard of that. It's a, it's a female. It's a, it's a, it's a Jesus, woman singer. Man. Right? <laughs> woman yes, singer. yes, yes. She's a woman singer. <laughs> and you know, she's half black. Oh, really? Yeah. So like, I don't know for anybody that watched Swarm directed by, uh, you know, uh, Childish Gambino or Donald Glover. Um, it was really good. Um, but yeah, there's like a part where, you know, like the, the black uh, character, she, she says, you know, um, to, to this other actress who's actually uh, being played by um, Michael Jackson's daughter. She's like, yeah, you know, my dad was half. And she's like, half what? <laughs> Well, also, I just saw, uh, you know, Logic, right? The rapper. Yeah, yeah, he's another one. Yeah. Apparently, apparently he just said the N word the other day. And I watched like a, like a group of black guys with a podcast being like, 
is it okay that he said the n-word and the one dude is just like hell no man like, <laughs> hell no. Like, and they showed his dad and they're like i want to hear his dad talk yeah and when they heard his dad talk they were like hell no man they were like and they, 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 they were just like no and like it actually it kind of seemed like they were appealing a little bit to like the cultural they're like i don't give a shit if his dad is half black like listen to this family like, bro, they're not, bro. Have, have you watched atlanta no, I, I my girlfriend loves Atlanta. Dude, you gotta watch Atlanta. I I promise you, it's. Hearing, she's hearing you say this right now, and she's gonna message me and be like, "See, it's so good, man." I All right, you. it's so good, but there's this one part, right? You know, um, where like you know, the 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 one character, Paperboy, right? Um, like you know, he's a rapper, and they're trying to do some kind of fundraiser thing, right? And it's like a bunch of like famous like black artists and stuff. And one of them, like I guess, is supposed to be like a stand-in for for Logic, who like <laughs> does not look, you know, black, right? Mm -hmm. And he keeps hearing him say the N word, and he's like, "Does this sound weird to anybody else? Like, does it? It just it do, it doesn't sound right, right?" Like, yeah. <laughs> I well, dude, lose the, my in, shit every time. And I'm not saying that this is uh, that this is like, you know, something that should be applied, uh, you know, with a broad brush to all people or anything like that. But the person that I was specifically hearing uh, comment on uh, Logic saying the N word was actually bringing up another like completely white individual that he grew up with in uh, oh, this certain neighborhood in Los Angeles who was adopted from foster care. And he was like, I'm more comfortable with him saying it <laughs> than Logic saying it. <laughs> Fucking, or have you ever heard Drake say it? I haven't. Dude, watch like an old interview that of him saying- That makes me a little uncomfortable. I'm not black, so it's not Dude, my place to get uncomfortable about it, but just it, thinking of Drake saying it makes me He says it almost with like a silent R at the end. And it's just kind of like, bro, what? <laughs> all right so mo mo moving on moving on because like you know the last thing chat needs to hear is like two like fucking pale faces talking about who should and should not be saying what <laughs> so. i think we gave the necessary caveat i think, I think, we, I think oh, we i'm did. not i'm not the authority on this but it's humorous like the situation with logic is pretty funny to hear. <laughs> it's fucking hysterical <laughs> um, so um this year is um uh severo martinez palais he's a guatemalan intellectual and marxist um, who wrote an extremely influential book in Guatemalan history uh, that is called La Patria de Criollo, which is the country of the Criollo, which is um, essentially the Criollo is the European blooded landowning class that supplanted the Europe, the European crown as the rulers of Guatemala following the revolution or not really revolution, the liberal revolution of 1821. So he writes in this book, a really, really amazing description of the dynamic that I've been talking about this whole time that we've been talking about this whole time. And uh, I will be deferring to him now in his, in his writing. Um, my contention is that the temporal end of colonialism did not signal the demise of the processes inherent to its operation, as neither independence nor the liberal reform succeeded in dismantling them. The reason for this is not difficult to understand. The social groups that assumed power at those crucial times, criollos at first and then medium-sized landowners later, did so precisely to benefit from the colonial structure, not to transform it. 30 years of Criollo dictatorship amounted to the pursuit of colonial policies without external influence. In effect, maintaining a colony without the presence of a mother country. So who does that sound uh, like? The United States. Right. It sounds almost that, exactly what like Gerald Warren was about, talking about. Reading about Guatemalan history gave me a whole different perspective on the United States, uh, the project of the United States as a colonial, as a settler colonial project. Because obviously I did all this before we got into Horn or anything right, like right, that. Right. So this is the first thing that really made me question like the United States um, situation or look at it in a different light. So um, just to go over what Pali is, is saying here, um, the, the end of colonialism did not mean the demise of the processes inherent to its operation. So you have this entire structure of a colony, but just on top of it, you have this mother country or the flag of a mother country. Right. Effectively, all that happened in independence is you bring that flag down and replace it with this new Guatemalan flag, right. which again, does not really respect the borders of the Mayan empire and also does not even respect like the language of the Mayan people as it just had it slapped on from a Nahuatl term that described the area. 
um, the social groups that assumed power did so precisely to benefit from the colonial structure, not to transform it. So these people, these, 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 uh, the, the Ladino or, or the Criollo, um, are the ones, they did not seek to dismantle colonialism. They just thought to be the ones operating it, to be the ones benefiting from it. Right. So in effect, they maintained a colony without the presence of a mother country. Do they, is, they preserved the power structure exactly. right, of that racial hierarchy and that yeah. social hierarchy uh, that amounts to like capital. You're higher up on, on you know, that that uh, that pyramid or wh whatever term you would want to use of like, mm -hmm. you know, social construction. Exactly. Exactly. Um, so this is, you know, in discussing um yes yes san Samika solidarity hour that is, is very it, common it, it is very col common in colonialism but i don't think it's very um i don't think it's very understood in the current um in the current in the minds of the current people who inhabit settler colonial empires um the united states has a very like this like very like happy like yeah we kicked the british out or you know we said you know fuck you to the british and we kicked them out but they don't recognize that they just effectively just assumed the role of the british wait did i did i do it or not where the fuck hang on a second red falcon i'll i'll, I'll get it to you do you want me to just type it in the chat yeah can you do it for me exactly exactly uh so i think that those that carry out this lib these liberal revolutions that carry effectively end the, the, the technical existence of a colony in the way that it extends that it has a connection with a mother country i think in their minds they actually isn't there some don't pat Sox try to say that the that the american revolution was anti-colonial mm -hmm. isn't that like a thing mm -hmm. people say that people say that you know, the establishment of Israel was an anti-colonial movement. I don't know if you've ever heard that. Yes, I have. That's what I'm saying. So it's like, you know, there's a way to like feel the valor of anti-colonialism, but in effect perpetuate it. That's the title of the book, right? What La Patria de Criollo? Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me just get one thing real quick. Bye. Severo Martinez Paez. There you go. I, I whispered it to you, Red Falcon, all right? Yeah. So this is actually a very famous book in Guatemalan academia. Um it, it's written in Spanish. Like it's not it's not like a Western depiction or a history of Guatemala. It's um from Guatemala itself. And um uh, Paez is a Marxist, also. Really, an early, early Marxist of yeah. Let's see. Let me see if I can pull him up. Real and quick. he's a smooth-looking motherfucker as well. Smooth, smooth. Like, boy. He he definitely steal my girl. Like look 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 at him, <laughs> look at him. Look at that mustache on point. Here, do you want to? Can you bring this up real quick, just to? Yeah yeah just, yeah. yeah. Just, what what are you sending we, it to me on? Just so that we, uh, Facebook, just All so right. that we can heap a little more praise onto my boy here because effectively you don't even really have to listen to me do this entire presentation you could read this paragraph and kind of know what i'm saying <laughs> if you combine this with um yeah so just zoom in yeah um oh you got to put this on onto uh oh shit i didn't even mine auto translates so i'm sorry um what are you using chrome yeah yeah that's probably why here i'll just read it just leave it up i'll just read okay, it. okay 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 um, uh, Jose Severo Martinez Paez was a Guatemalan Marxist, humanist, and historian. His main historical war work is La Patria de Criollo, an essay on the interpretation of the Guatemalan colonial reality, written in 1970, which analyzed the colonial, hi colonial history of Guatemala from the Marxist point of view and marked a before and after in the study of the history of that Central American country. So, yeah. Um, based guy, based book. Uh, oh, shit. He only out. died in 1998. It, yeah, he said he wrote it, and it said they wrote it in the 1970s. That's wild. All right, so let's go ahead. 
The native population of Guatemala har would hardly be the beneficiaries of the newfound independence and would find themselves further dispossessed and immiserated as a result of this process. Understanding this progression from Spanish colony to sovereign nation ruled dictatorially by Spanish-blooded elites is the essential foundation by which to demonstrate the impotent nature of independence postulated throughout Guatemala's history. So let's go back to that that um, that protest where these people are saying independence for who? Like right. this is this is the this is what is being expressed here by the indigenous populations of Guatemala. Um, so here's a quote from one of well, not really a whole quote, but just quoting a quote with one of my favorite. Um, uh, oh, I didn't even put his name on here. I'm, uh, it's silly. But uh, one of my favorite authors on the history of Guatemala, who is uh, Piero Gliacius. Gle 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 Have I you figured out? I, I need to listen to the Radio War Nerd interview with him again, um, because I think he's technically Italian. He's Italian. He's right. Italian. Yeah. Piero. Piero Gliacius. Jesus. Yeah. So um, one of the one of my favorite books on Guatemalan history, uh, Shattered Hope, the Guatemalan Revolution and the United States, 1944 to 1954. I need to finish it at some point. I still have it. Yeah. So now we're going into the colonial development of Guatemala or the, the independent development of Guatemala at this point. So Guatemala's national independence ushered in a series of pivotal economic and political developments. In the words of historian Pierre, oh, I did have his name, Piero Glacius, uh, <laughs> lacking gold, sugar, and spices, Guatemala had been an impoverished and neglected colony throughout the, the three centuries of Spanish rule. Even after independence, it remained an impoverished backwater. Coffee was to change this. So, um, even in its entirety of uh, being colonized, um, Guatemala was like this, the the. The, the bastard child of right. the Spanish empire. It, you know, many of the other, you know, places like Peru and Bolivia had like mineral resources. I think Mexico even had mineral resources, you know, more abundant. There was gold, there was tin, there was many, many things that made um, many places very, very um, lucrative for colonization. Guatemala did not have these things. It was no. an impoverished backwater throughout and a neglected colony throughout the three centuries of Spanish rule. And then even after independence, it remained an impoverished backwater. And what changed this? Coffee. And as I'm sure most people in here know, coffee is not indigenous to South America or no. Central America or many of the places where like coffee is so um, frequently sourced from at Starbucks or whatever. I'm pretty sure all co coffee originates from Ethiopia. I think I think it's literally just Ethiopia and then it's spread everywhere else. I could be wrong about that. Um, no, I'm pretty but, certain you're correct. Yeah. So what you have here is Guatemala. It just got independence. So let's go forward because I actually right. explained this in the next paragraph. I don't want to just restate what I'm going to say here. Yeah, I'll, I'll wait till after you're done to say yeah. what I got to say. Yeah. Oh, okay. So I'll, I'll read this in. So despite obtaining independence from Spain, Guatemala still existed marginally within the global economic landscape. During the last decades of the 19th century, Guatemala's indigent position would be invigorated through the introduction of cash crops such as coffee and bananas. While Guatemala lacked in lucrative mineral resources, it compensated with exploitable indigenous labor and vast swaths of arable land. This combination of cheap labor and cheap land made Guatemala ripe for investment, which consequently wrenched it into the modern world economy. Coffee was the chief catalyst in the industrial development of Guatemala, as it required the construction of roads, railways, and ports to transport the coffee to market. Transport routes would be accompanied by the creation of telephone and telegraph networks to facilitate communication between plantations, cities, and buyers overseas. So, um... Oh, that's very likely, San Samica Solidarity Hour, that, like, you know, it grew wild in Yemen. Um, but even then, like, it's still, like colonial borders right you know there's the possibility that like it grew in both and that in ethiopia right it was just uh i don't know well, yeah i could be wrong i could be, we yeah, could I definitely could be, we could be totally wrong i'm i'm i i'm just going off oh, of like what i remember 
origin places of coffee. Right. I know I know that the way that coffee is grown in many, many places in the world now is not a natural occurrence. That's like a man-made, much like we're talking about potatoes in fucking right. Ireland, things like that. Uh, coffee, I think, is primarily a gift to the world from Ethiopia. Right. Um, so do you want me to... Did you have something you want to yeah. say before? Yeah, un unlike myself going off of, you know, just purely, like, memory and, like, you know, ha half-remembered fucking things because I'm shot the fuck out. Uh, Piero, if you're ever interested in reading a book that will have more citations than anything you have ever written in your entire life, read anything by Piero Glegesis, or however the hell you pronounce his name, because that man has so many citations and everything is backed up not just by you know happenstance or, or, or anything else like he will cite like internal cia memos he will cite he will go out to guatemala and interview people that were there or spouses and, of the people that were there well and in this very presentation as i have re relied very heavily on mr Gray jesus's book um there's many many quotes directly from his book also to your point the exact interviews that he does with Jacobo Arbenz's wife are, con are contained in this presentation also. So pretty much everything that Johnny just referenced is is uh, is yeah. very much what holds up this house of cards that I have here where I pretend to be a historian <laughs> by, by paraphrasing the work of the real historians. Well, I mean, like, in, and if you're interested in his other works, he also has a lot of works related to uh, Cuba and in their in, in Af and their assistance to revolutionaries in Africa that mm -hmm. like you know he backs up everything not just with Cuban you know documents but also American documents from the CIA I, I have I have his one book called Conflicting Missions and it's about the 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 triangle of the United States Africa and Cuba um yeah. you know and we're at where Cuba assisted on behalf of uh the Mid Namibian uh population against the uh you know South African forces um, so just to go over the, the, before you move forward here, so this is really important. So even after the revolution, there's not much going on in Guatemala. Um, but, you know, obviously we're getting into the 1800s at this point. Um, international trade is becoming bigger. Um, the industrial revolution is happening. And so now people see Guatemala as something that, okay, maybe it doesn't have mineral resources, but you know what it does have? A bunch of open land and a bunch of indigenous people who we can effectively enslave. So let's plant a bunch of fucking coffee there. Now we're just going to have a bunch of coffee plantations. So a bunch of even Germans came over and started coffee plantations there and things like that. Um, and this is the chief reason that Gu Guatemala even had a in industrial revolution was purely to cater to mm -hmm. coffee plantations so people want to invest there for coffee great we're going to need roads so that we can transport it we need railroads we need ports so we can bring this over to europe because that's where we're going to sell it we need um we need now we need telecommunication lines all of this was a consequence of the coffee plantations right so what was effectively a nothing plot of land in central america became a coffee plantation colony uh, of sorts purely for extractive economic processes yeah i'm not trying to say it as a good thing like yeah, 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 yeah no, no. i'm not trying to yeah. say like you look at all the gifts of right. this i'm saying like you know uh right so do you want to read this one sure while this newfound economic viability would be beneficial to the landed elite of guatemala it would be deleterious effect. It would have deleterious effects on the already disadvantaged indigenous communities. Vast coffee estates were developed, and the real estate was acquired through the dispossession, I love that word, of indigenous land. This surge in coffee plantations required a commensurate increase in labor to till the land. Already dispossessed of their ancestral land, which they relied on for subsistence agriculture, indigenous communities became increasingly reliant on wage labor to meet basic needs. Reminiscent of the Spanish colonial procedures of requerimiento and encomienda, the desperate position of indigenous communities would be accentuated by a series of legislations which effectively permitted forced labor protocols. So, okay, so, so we're, we're all walking on this journey together here. So, <laughs> Guatemala was really had nothing in terms of industry, in terms of like major agriculture or anything like that. So now the Europeans are just like seeing this as a way where they can invest and grow a lot of coffee that they can sh sell on the international market. So we, first off, we need, we need land. 
right? And uh, there's all these indigenous communities all over here that are using this land for boo, subsistence agriculture, boo, the ancestral way that they have all, uh, you know, uh, fed and, 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 and you know, uh, uh, supported themselves for generations. We need to get them off of that land so that we can make plantations. And this is especially valuable for those that are, uh, for the plantation owners for two reasons. One, because they need the land, but two, they need people to work on the land. And, um, slave, uh, wage labor was not something that was particularly that's that made particular sense to the indigenous communities because the, the, the very, very paltry wages that were being offered by plantation, uh, plantation owners, many indigenous people were just saying like, I, I just, I, I we have this land, we grow food. It supports us. Why would we be, um, why would we go and work on your plantation for pennies when we just feed ourselves and our communities just live off this? So it's a double-edged sword here where, um, where they are like, well, we have to wrench them off the land, dispossess them. So now they don't have any subsistence land anymore. So now they have to work for wage labor. They are forced into a wage labor contract with us. So we dispossess them of the land because um, we are, you know, it's the white man's burden to take that land and for the Lockean theory of property, you know, we'll will work it better than they will. Um, and then we will offer them paltry wages to work it because they have no other means of survival at this point because we took away the thing that they had survived on for generations. So a couple things in chat. Uh, San Samika Solidarity Hour. I assume they probably actually would have roasted them on site and then sent them out. Um, uh, but, 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 yeah, that is funny. If they did, you know, instead of coffee, use Yerba, the human species would be 90% caffeine in the water. <laughs> We'd just all be like, you know, just cripplingly addicted to caffeine. Um, does anyone want to discuss how the House of the Mouse has thwarted DeSantis with a bizarre legal thing called Rule Against Perpetuities and based it on the longevity of the Windsor family of England? Very weird. Um, no, you can't make this shit up. It is very strange, but it's a little off topic for what we planned on discussing today. Um, you know, maybe, uh, you know, another Wild Card Friday, you know, we can look into it a little bit more, you know. Um, but, uh, you know, we don't like discussing things without having at least like a little bit of research on it you know as interesting of a topic as it may be i'm not trying to uh dismiss your comment outright i do think it's interesting but we don't really have uh anything to to go off of on it for that, yeah. yeah we're not really prepared for that but uh thank you for bringing that up uh, it has and been an unusual thing going on in florida for the last year and hey everybody, we got 60 people in here right now. This is uh, one of the this is the largest audience I think we've ever really uh, put together without like a you know um, very very large raid. Um, so shout out to everybody for being here. Thank you yeah. so much. Thank um, you all for giving us your time. Yeah, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, if you're new, if you haven't been here the whole time, we're going over a, uh, a history of Guatemala. Um, we're going over history of Guatemala from essentially from its independence, a little bit of its colonial history going up until the land reform program of Jacobo Arbenz. And then we'll be uh, reading a portion of Killing Hope by William Blum to talk about the coup that the well-known coup that happened in the 1950s. So essentially, we're just holding everyone's hand up into that point and then right. letting William Blum kind of guide us uh, through the coup. Yeah. We're giving you a panoramic view of like the last uh, century of Guatemalan history. And, uh, you know, I, I'm, I wanted to announce this a couple times while I'm in here. Um, anybody that's in here, if you're enjoying the content, also uh, at the bottom right corner, you will see a donate to charity button. Um, I am currently involved with books through bars in Philadelphia. I'm volunteering with them and I'm trying to raise money to contribute to their cause. They um, are a uh, nonprofit organization that gets books to those who otherwise cannot get them incarcerated individuals um so yeah if you can throw a dollar in there it would be greatly appreciated and i promise it's going to a good cause yeah and for those of you that have never been here before we are subversive history uh we're a little bit more like a book club than we are a you know react stream or anything else even I, i've heard people like call us like a podcast and stuff eh, even that isn't like that accurate we have our discord link below if you're watching us you know on your computer right and you can hop in there and uh you know get uh access to any of the books that we go over or any of the peripheral books that you know uh, we use right in terms of like researching for a topic a lot of times we go over a book chapter by chapter and you can find old episodes of us on our YouTube going over uh, you know books like
like Black Shirts and Reds by Michael Parenti. I think we went like halfway through uh, The Counter-Revolution uh, of 1776 by Gerald Horn. Uh, the Divide by Jason Hickel is an all-time, like, you know, out yeah. of this park, greatest hit, like... Required reading. Required as as reading. reading. Um, you know, and uh, we definitely recommend that you read along with us. And, uh, you know, we want nothing more than, you know, for you to tell us what you think about like the chapter of every book that we go over and uh sometimes we do stuff like this when pat is just super well versed on the topic that we're going over and we give you a little bit more of like a deep dive on the history of uh you know whatever it is we're talking about maverick thank you so much for your contribution to uh books through bars we sincerely appreciate that um it will go to a good cause and that 15 dollars that sounds right about a, a, a book maybe a maybe a huey newton book that might find its way into the hands of uh <laughs> an individual uh, that is currently incarcerated. So thank you so much. Yeah, hopefully we can, uh, you know, purchase at least two copies of uh, Malcolm X's autobiography. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, is there a way where I can say that I only want my, uh, <laughs> my, my donation to go to like, you know, black revolutionary literature? Yeah, to like, into this, I don't I, care who's reading it. <laughs> I don't care who winds up with it, but if I can get Walter Rodney in the hands of an incarcerated person, there's something particularly dark about American meddling in Central and South America. Oh, Sabutai, it's... I want to say I agree, but I don't know if it's particular or not when I compare it to Africa and Asia. I almost think that Asia is the particularly, like, really, really... Like, the amount of, like, millions and the napalm, I don't know. But that's obviously up to subjective. I, right. I, I'm sure you can make a compelling case of why. Because there's that notion, that Monroe Doctrine notion of this is our backyard. It's an entire right. half of the planet, but we like to pretend that it's our backyard. Um, and so we have this, like, paternalistic control over this entire hemisphere. Um, so, yeah, I can see why that is. I, I've pretty much convinced myself in about... 15 seconds of talking i mean we as outsiders looking in can make all kinds of comparison or you know contrasting you know arguments about who had it worse but to the people that are affected i don't believe there's much of a difference i agree and yeah maverick honestly feels good that a small donation go to purchasing a book that can be shared for years by many right. yeah that's really awful to think about that like because like a lot of times like you know obviously i think Food is probably a more pressing concern for some people than books, but it is kind of interesting and nice to know that, you know, a book can like pass through many hands and change like the idea of, of so many people. And it's like this thing that like it gets in one person's hand and it, and it resonates with them and then someone else can read it. And that, that is also a very cool way of looking at it. All right. You want to read this one? Sure. The Minister of Development for 1885, President Manuel Lissandro Barrias uh, justified the mandate stating, it is necessary to make the Indian work for his own good, for the good of the business and for the country, because as a result of his apathetic and stationary character and his few needs, he is satisfied with practically nothing. By apathetic and stationary and few needs, the official is referring to the lack of, dis lack of interest indigenous communities expressed in bourgeois consumerism, being fully content to work just enough to fulfill the basic needs of their families. This dynamic was not satisfactory to meet the profit motives of plantation owners. Thus, more coercive labor laws were implemented, such as... Uh, Oh, son of a bitch. Reglamento de uh, jornale, Jornaleros. Re Reglamento de Because uh, a J is like a Y, right? It's like an H, I think. It's a, or, or it would be Jornaleros. So Reglamento yeah. de Jornaleros. Regulations for day laborers. No, I'm committed, man. I'm going to do it. <laughs> Formalized debt peonage to plantation owners further constricted the fate of indigenous workers. Oh, wow. Thank uh, you, Whitney, Whitney Corn God. Corn Thank God. you so much for, for uh, contributing uh, to the Books Through Bars. That is another book that will enter the prison system from perhaps the most marginalized group in the United States at this point. So thank you so much. I, I like uh, misread that name like three different times. I thought it was Whitney Corn God, and then I looked more and I'm like, <laughs> no, it's Whitey Corn Good. <laughs> yes. 
So um, here we are further elaborating on what I was talking about before, that you have to essentially wrench the indigenous community off of their land and then make them essentially dependent on wage labor, which they otherwise would not have um, willingly engaged in because it just wasn't worth it for them. Uh, this uh, official of the Boreas uh, government of 1885 as so that they have few needs or apathetic and stationary which pretty much means that they weren't won't work for peanuts on our plantations right. so that means that we need to figure out so if you go forward this is one of the um this is what they put together to be able to effectively conscript the indigenous population into plantation work so the regulation of day laborers or decree 177 of the liberal governments of guatemala was issued by the liberal government of general justo rafino barrios to guarantee the supply of young settlers for the large oh, coffee farms God. that began with that government. After the promul promulgation of the decree of redemption of census of decree 170 a few months before, and that facilitated the expropriation of the communal lands of the indigenous people. This liberal legislation placed the Guatemalan indigenous population practically at the disposal of the interests of the new coffee la la latifundas and the tradition which are plantation owners and the traditional conservatives with the notable exception of the regular clergy of the catholic catholic church who were expelled from the country the decree established that the indigenous people were obliged to work on the farms when their owners needed them and regardless of where they were and who and they were also under the guardianship of the local authorities who were in charge of ins ensuring that the contingents of indians were sent to the farms oh so um, we're just gonna you know just have the police there to make sure that they're going to the farms to answer to the farmers. That's right. well, And as we read, read a little bit more about the situation in the United States and the way that the United States wanted to incentivize um, settlers by offering them very cheap land, land that was being dispossessed from the Native Americans. Am I am I right with that? Yeah, it just it's, it sounds like slavery, um, but with extra steps. <laughs> that's precisely yeah. That's, that's precisely that's a, precisely what it is. Um, so to guarantee the supply of young settlers to the large coffee farms, the government of Guatemala, uh, effectively was like, we'll just steal land. Right. You know, it says right here, facilitated the expropriation of communal lands. This was a, um, on the books policy. This isn't conjecture or, you know, uh, you know, a, a leftist summarization. Right. Uh, of the situation so this was effectively like the indigenous population is a malleable labor force that is at the disposal of settlers who will also be able to uh cheaply acquire their land thank you for uh, the donation sans amigo de solidarity thank hour solidarity hour thank you so much for your donation uh towards um the books through bars um charity another book in another hands of a marginalized individual we thank you so much um all right. So this is just another example of, of the progression of this coercive forced labor program that was uh, imposed upon the indigenous of uh, Guatemala. Also, I love the way that this Wikipedia article, article correctly uses the word liberal yeah. throughout it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like they're saying that this was a liberal law because yeah. this was this is the liberal revolution of Guatemala. Right. At the heart of liberalism, it is the 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 free trade is the liberalism of capital it is you know the the to justify the and protect the rights of the movement of of capital right or yeah. those uh, directing the 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 means of production um Just like but the liberal revolution of the united states this right. is the face of liberalism in the uh 19th century this is what the entire ideology this is what Lockean and property value of property is referring to well i mean like even w w wasn't it Locke that said that like those who till the land you know uh, in some capacity have rights to it Locke almost had a somewhat marxian perspective on labor where that whoever was able to produce the most on the land that almost like labor had a transformative um effect on land where like you know uh if someone was a, you could effectively transform the right. property value of land through labor but much in a much different way than marx would put it he uh Locke has effectively said that like oh if there's indigenous people on the land and they don't like have like our industrialized farming practices or whatever that effectively you can kill them kick them off do whatever you want because that's your property so that you bring up farming practices and it's so funny because i'm willing to bet money that like the farming practices 
are literally just practices brought over from Europe, you know, whereas like these people, yeah. it, it talks about how they were interested only in just making enough, right? Because they probably developed these farming methods over thousands of years of living they, they, there. They were so dialed in. They were so dialed right. in. Right. And this is, if you ever read the book, um, um, the Making of the Third World by Mike Davis, El Nino right. Holocaust, uh, El Nino Famines and the Making of the Third World. I promise uh, we'll read it. Victorian Holocausts. I mean, this uh, successful form of um, liberal cash crop um, agriculture. Monocrop. Killed like 250 million people in the in the late 19th and early 20th century. Right. Um, you know, I know how people like to say Black Book of Communists, 100 million dead. I mean, actually, you know, capitalism cash cropping british and india all of these things actually really did and we're not even conflating these numbers killed like between like 170 and 250 million people right and that's without military intervention oh that's no military intervention right this is famine famine related deaths because of um taking communities that survived for many many centuries off of working the land that they had lived on for their for their entire existence and then being like oh you know all that land that you grow food for and that you 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 understand adeptly that you use this land for the cows because then they refertilize and like all of these things that they have that it's like this very symbiotic way of working the land this is all cotton now right Oh, and you said this is happening in India, right? Well, not currently, but this no, is no, what no, no. But like this, what you're talking about India, happened in it. Oh, if it's India, it's not centuries; it's millennia. That's like right. some of the yeah. oldest civilization, like yeah. on record. <laughs> like exactly. And then some Brits come in and they're like, "Oh, all this then? That's cotton." <laughs> well, oh, what's all this then? <laughs> you got any bangers and mash? <laughs> This is purely for educational purposes. All right, no snitching. Did you get clapped for this? No, I'm just saying. Uh, okay. We'll probably get clapped on YouTube for it, but... So this is the time period that we're discussing here with the regulation of day laborers. So as you can see here, this is a coffee plantation, and I think that it's pretty easily, you know, for us to see here that doesn't look like there's a lot of white people working on it. This is the indigenous communities that are being for essentially forced into slavery to work on these coffee plantations. Yeah, nobody looks like they're uh, singing and whistling and uh, working very happily. <laughs> so uh, I, I imagine this was not um, a uh, 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 an agreed upon sort of uh, uh, non-coercive, you know, agreement, whatever, you know what I mean. Guatemala attracted the attention of several multinational corporations due to its favorable investment atmosphere, whatever the fuck that means. The most prominent... I mean, it is. I mean, if you're, I'm saying, if you're somebody like United Fruit Company or these other things, and you're like, oh, what, you have a virtual slave colony that you'll give me, like, that you'll give me uh, you know, very cheap rates on right. land? I mean, that is a favorable investment atmosphere. I'm not saying it's good, but right. if you're a cutthroat capitalist multinational company, that is the fertile grounds for you to lay your sweet, sweet investments. Sweet, sweet investments. The most prominent titans of industry to emerge in the 20th century, in 20th century Guatemala, would be Empresa Electrica, International Railways of Central American, or oh, is this Central, Amer America. Central America, or IRCA. You got, you got me. I got you. Finally got you. And United Fruit Company. Bum, bum, bum. These yeah. <laughs> companies would have an unrivaled effect in the evolution of Guatemalan society, thus understanding their development and practices are essential for further contextualizing this investigation of Guatemalan and not autonomy or lack thereof. Right. So again, we are, you know, overall just discussing this idea of independent Guatemala. Um, you know, obviously we, we've been on a little bit of a journey here from the beginning. If you haven't been here, you might un not understand why I keep harkening back to that. But it's because in 2021, there was the Independence Day celebration, but it was mostly protests right. in Guatemala City. I, so, I, I can't wait for us to get a soundboard so I can do like a lightning strike noise or something or like some kind of <laughs> bum, bum, bum every time like we see like the dullest brothers or like you know united fruit company or some shit um hash kush i was just about to bring that up i thought it was, i put this little stamp on here because it's funny because it's like a banana like fruit company and they're like no bananas just put a gun on there yeah fuck it just put a double barrel shotgun on it you know <laughs> <laughs> just put an uh, elephant okay. gun on there yeah. is that supposed to mean something like nah what, what, what could it mean 
<laughs> Ross, I don't think it's fair that multinational billion dollar companies get to be a get to be people, but I don't get to be a multinational billion dollar company. <laughs> It's a good point. You should bring that up to, to Mittens Romney. See what he what says about that. In the UFCO and the CIA. I don't know. Maybe you should hang out for a second. And uh, maybe in you know the next uh, you know 20 to 30 minutes, there will be an in-depth breakdown on all the in, um, incestuous relations between the CIA and the United Fruit Company. I don't know. Something just gives me a, a mm. weird little feeling in my undercarriage some, that some, that's coming. Some kind of taste in the air or something um, like, like pennies. Tastes like blood. <laughs> oh, I'm having a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right back. I gotta use the bed. Yeah, yeah. Do you want me to read or do you want me to hold off? Um, and wait it's up to you. I don't care. Either way. We'll just, I'll just hold off. Yeah, Chiquita is uh, the United Fruit Company. Uh, the United Fruit Company did not cease to exist, but I believe it changed its name to kind of like uh, shake off some of that very dirty, dirty, dirty reputation that it... Um, that it uh, accumulated while uh, operating in Central America and the Caribbean. Um, <clears throat> you know, the entire, if, if anybody in chat has ever heard the term banana republic, that is pretty much solely because of the work of the United Fruit Company, uh, the disreputable actions that they took in um, subjugating communities, uh, breaking unions, murdering people, massacres of strikers and all of these things that happened in uh, Honduras, in Guatemala, in Jamaica. Uh, many, many places. I, I'm not an expert in all of them. I, I definitely know about um, in Guatemala. Yeah, the UFC crying to CIA every minute. Yeah, they will make many, many, many um, requests to the CIA about the unfair treatment that they were receiving in uh, in Guatemala with the the. Uh, it's just the, the mean, mean communists that want to just abuse uh, United States companies uh, for no. For no um, legitimate reason other than uh, mean communism. Uh, yeah. All right. I'm just going to read this. I don't know. Uh, Impreza Electrica was originally founded in Guatemala by German coffee planters in 1894. I don't know if you remember earlier when I was talking about the coffee uh, investment that was coming from around the world. Guatemala was becoming very ripe for investment and then German coffee planters uh, decided to make their way to Guatemala and settle there. This here, Impresa Electra, Electrica, was originally founded in Guatemala by German coffee planters in 1894. Can you pick this up? I'm going to pizza. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Still, uh, German coffee planters in 1894 and still exists as the primary electric company in contemporary Guatemala. Holy shit. During World War I, Guatemala would ally with the United States and, as a result, seized German-owned assets within the country, including Empresa Electrica. After ratifying Governmental Agreement 742, which authorized the confiscation, nationalization, and sale of Empresa Electrica, the company passed to private American ownership, electric bond, and share, for a paltry compensation. Empresa Electrica would go on to abuse its privileged position as a virtual monopoly, supplying over 80% of Guatemala's electricity by charging extravagant rates for subpar service. In 1944, the company was still using the same equipment as the 1920s. Huh, sounds, uh, sounds, sounds pretty similar to uh, American you know, infrastructure and companies. Okay, what I Oh, nothing. I just read the the thing and was talking about how, like, isn't that kind of similar to, like, what we have going on here in the U.S., where, like, most of our shit was built, like, a quarter of a century ago, if not longer, and, like... Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, they would just continue to charge exorbitant rates for, um, uh, for, uh, you know, um infrastructure that they just refuse to that, right. they, that they never would really uh, right i mean like well i mean like we pay how much in fucking taxes and it's just like you know oh uh, make sure you boil your your, your water later because uh you know no telling what's in there <laughs> who knows what's going on, who knows what's going on over there? that bridge you drive over every day on your way to work in your car because uh you know the the public uh transportation is unreliable always late and you'll get fired for being late if you don't arrive on time in your private cars that you also have to pay to maintain and pay taxes to make sure that the roads are maintained they're not um you know uh it, it it need I go on like the the bridge is like about to collapse any fucking minute for like the last ten fucking years you know what I mean? 
Yes. Fucking whole ass apartment buildings with people living in them in Florida just collapse, you know, for some reason in the night. The clothing store Banana Republic is was owned by Jeffrey Epstein's sponsor number one, Les Wexner. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, we we're not true or not, all right? Like you know, you want that stuff? Uh, go 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 run after Brace, you know. Plus, did they even do cool episodes about that stuff anymore, or is it all just like you know, fucking uh, some other bullshit? Trains flying off the tracks left and right. Yeah, and what is our fucking transportation fucking uh? President, whatever, fucking, what's his name, Booty Giggle, fucking, you know, whenever, like, we bring up the fact, oh, another train with hazardous chemicals spilled over, he's just like, Pete, there it is, Petey fucking Booty Giggle is like, oh, there's, there's like a thousand every year, uh, we can't really stop them, they're just, you know, a fact of life, and they're gonna keep happening. Fucking rat face, fucking... Honestly, that's mean to rats. Rats are actually really cool pets. Yeah, so, I love rats. Yeah. All so. right, let's move forward. All right, all right, all right, fine. By 1912, almost all of Guatemala's railroads were controlled by International Railways of Central America, which was a U.S. company founded by railroad mogul and banana entrepreneur, Minor Keith. Guatemala's undeveloped road system solidified the railroad monopoly as the only practical means of a commercial transportation. In this era of limited infrastructure, Guatemala only possessed one deep water port, Puerto Barrios, and this port was responsible for 60% of Guatemala's foreign trade. IRCA not only owned the only railway capable of reaching Puerto Barrios, but also privately owned its only pier. The, this grotesque monopoly was described by a United Nations report. Thus, there is a virtual monopoly of foreign trade of the Central American countries, and it is impossible for them to control the port fees, which are frequently excessive and discriminatory. The World Bank would echo this position, concluding, to all intents and purposes, Puerto Barrios is under complete control of the United Fruit Company and the International Railways Company. That control extends over the movement of practically all import and export cargo throughout the Atlantic area. So, um, you know, this is like, you know, the, 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 they refer to the United Fruit Company. Actually, I don't even want to, we'll bring that up in a second, but the IRCA, you can see that the way that this private company is able to effectively control an entire country because right. they own the, you know, 60% of foreign trade outside of Guatemala has to go through the only deep water pier that they have, the deep water port that they have, right. which they own the only railroad that railway that can get there and the only deep water port or the only pier that comes off of the deep water port. And you know what this kind of reminds me of? Yeah. Puerto Rico. What? Yeah. That like, you know, literally almost all of its infrastructure is owned it, like in in all by like private american companies like their their communications infrastructure right like a lot of i think like their water treatment plants even um a lot of like their roadways and like that kind of infrastructure rail lines you name it and of course they have no say over like any of this because their uh the government is literally not even decided upon by themselves it's decided upon by like you know uh what is it congress or something they elect like a governor right i'm not sure so here's just a little bit um uh just so you can see this is where Prato barrios is you can see why it's so essential um to be able to get exports out into uh the atlantic ocean to their respective destinations wow that is fucked If IRCA was powerful, United Fruit was Colossus. The United Fruit Company would be the largest and most significant company to operate in Guatemala during the 20th century. UFCO would exert a tyrannical influence over Guatemalan infrastructure, commerce, and political life. UFCO came to fruition, <laughs> get it, from the merger of Boston Fruit Company and Minor Keith's personal empire of Central American railroads. It would become the world's largest grower and exporter of bananas. UFCO empire spanned over 3.5 million acres of banana plantations across Central America and the Caribbean. 
Aside from the banana plantations, UFCO also controlled its own system of railroads spanning 1,400 miles. In addition to its private railroads, it also owned 42% of the previously mentioned IRCA. So everything that, I just re- that we just read in the last slide about the IRCA, now combine that with UFCO and then understand that, that UFCO owns 42% of that railway company. That's... They- they talk about, they call the United Fruit Company El Pulpo, right. which means the octopus, because it has like all these tentacles that are just in everything. Fucking, you know what's also crazy I've been thinking about this entire time is that like, if not for like indigenous people, I'm pretty certain that like the banana as a fruit would be like what, like mostly seeds, right? Like wild yeah, bananas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, wild bananas, they they got, like, seeds the size of walnuts in them, and, like, you know, only, like, 20% of it you can actually fucking eat. Bananas at the U.S. by storm, they were so popular that the litter of banana peels was a serious problem with people slipping on them. I really hope you're just fucking with me, Sansamik. <laughs> also, um, did Coca-Cola also have guest squads in Guatemala? I only know of Colombia. Um, if they did, I'm not certain. I think think they did in puerto rico because i know that um i know in colombia uh what's his name um immortal technique has talked about it in puerto rico like a lot too right i'm not sure like i said i only know of the colombian right yeah don't yeah you can't quote us on any of this i mean like unless we're reading a slide which we know is a quote like you know there were psa posters about throwing them away come on (laughs) <laughs> Saint Samika, come on. Oh god damn, that's a lot of banana. Guatemalan banana plantation um around this time period. And there's just like people popping up like the more you look at the picture, yeah. it's like <laughs> In 1901, UFCO was hired to manage Guatemala's postal service, and in 1913, UFCO created the Tropical Radio and Telegraph Company, responsible for the majority of Guatemala's telecommunications, further solidifying the company's domination over infrastructure. UFCO owned and operated the world's largest private navy, known as the Great White Fleet, holy shit, which it used primarily to transport bananas but also would lease their services to facilitate most of the foreign trade to and from Guatemala. Beginning in 1924, UFCO continued to consolidate its land holdings, and by 1945 it stood as the largest private landowner and biggest employer in Guatemala, the second largest being IRCA, which again was half-owned by UFCO. The annual budget of UFCO was larger than those of the countries which it operated. And there's like a picture right there of the uh, steamship service sailings of the Great White Fleet. Wow. So um, um, this is just further, further illustrating the immense, like tyrannical monopoly control that the United Fruit Company had over an entire nation, multiple nations, actually, because I'm pretty sure they did similar things in Jamaica and in uh, Honduras. But um, obviously what I know most of right now is guatemala so this is where a a a multinational corporation can become effectively more far more powerful than the country i mean the uh the government of the country where the government is merely a subordinate of representatives uh that that are willing to engage in favorable um favorable transactions with this uh you know overseer company right These American con- oh, do you want to read this? Yeah. Okay. These American gl- conglomerates would be afforded significant privileges from the Guatemalan political sphere. This dynamic was acknowledged in a 1950 State Department memo, which states foreign companies, through arrangements favorable to the dictator in power at the moment, have been able to obtain large concessions and large privileges. These privileges would primarily materialize in the form of tax exemptions. And according to a 1950 study, three U.S.-based financial experts concluded that a careful estimate indicates 
states that in all three cases, that's United Fruit Company, RICA, and the Impreza Electric that we first talked about, the tax liability is in the neighborhood of one half of what it would be in the absence of the contracts. Even when colluding with dictatorial state powers to obtain favorable advantages, these companies would routinely evade their minimal financial obligations. So um, you can see here through like, there, there's, I didn't have, really had the time or the energy to put all the many um leaders of guatemala that were like food there was coups prior to Jacobo Arbenz. he was not the first coup there was other um leaders in the 1800s and the 1900s who did not want to play ball with the united food company right. and they were cooed there was other people who there was election tampering pretty much it's like if you were not willing to play ball with united food company you would not have any political power in guatemala so in this, they would make these special contracts that, according to financial experts in um, studies uh, in 1950, that they reduced about half of the taxation that would have been there otherwise. And then if you go forward, like I said, even when colluding with dictatorial state powers, um, these companies would routinely evade their very minimal tax contributions. So it's that's explained here, where UFC methods of fraud would be detailed in a study by the Canadian Trade Commissioner in 1949. So this is about the trade that they specifically do with Canada, like the bananas that they sell from Guatemala to Canada. In total trade with Canada, Guatemala achieved in 1948 a balance in her favor of about $500,000, according to Guatemalan statistics. Canadian statistics show this balance to be much higher. This is due to the fact that the United Fruit Company in its intercompany trading between Guatemala and the United States only places a small nominal value on banana exports. On entry into Canada, they recorded at their proper value, which is some 700% higher than recorded in the Guatemalan export returns. So there's a lot of like, I don't know if this would be considered like a shell game kind of situation here, but just undervaluing, overvaluing, which turns into like 700% profit uh, with the exports entering Canada. Since the time of Guatemala's liberal revolution, the state apparatus allowed UFCO to operate in Guatemala, as if it were a private fiefdom. Numerous dictators would be appointed through foreign intervention, and those who were unwilling to provide preferential treatment to the multinationals would be replaced in short order. Historically, Pre a prevalent qualities of Guatemalan politicians included A, granting immense concessions to American multinational companies, and B, the willingness to subjugate the indigenous population into a malleable labor force. These characteristics were fully embodied by Guatemala's 21st president, Jorge Ubico. Ubico, like most Guatemalan politicians of his time, paralyzed, or parlayed his military status to a political career. As a military officer, Ubico would garner a notorious reputation from his cruel yet efficient punishment of banditry and smuggling at the Mexican border. And that's him, huh? That is him. That is Ubico. He's very soft features. <laughs> <laughs> yep, uh, he's a real bastard, though. Yes, um, yes, obviously. Let's go forward. I'll explain that more. Ubico's presidency, presidency came during a tumultuous period in Guatemala's history. The reverberations of the Great Depression had caused a collapse in the once lucrative coffee market and in turn bankrupt Guatemala's economy. Unemployment was rampant. The economic situation and the social consequences it produced were so precarious that it caught the attention of observers, observers from the U.S. Embassy, who stated there was a great deal of unrest among the working classes and noting the gathering of red storm clouds. With the R Russian Revolution of 1917 haunting recent memory, this threat of communist development alarmed the U.S. State Department. This issue required a heavy hand to contain, and Ubico's reputation for cruel efficiency elicited a heartfelt endorsement from the U.S. Embassy. During the hour and a half that I spent with the general, I was impressed with the almost Anglo-Saxon frankness of the band. He is what is known at here as the white type, untainted by mixed blood. So um, this is uh, wow. Yeah, you know, what in, what this the embassy is like reporting like on its official cables at this point in the 1930s. Um, you could uh, hardly tell he was, uh, you know, some kind of subhuman. Well, well uh, yeah. Um, so what we have here is the Great Depression happens. Um, coffee, which I guess is considered somewhat of like a non-essential consumption habit, um, tanks during the Great Depression. So with it, tanks the economy of Guatemala. Yeah, who's so going to be the, able to get it? Nobody's got any money. <laughs> like, yeah, when the economy tanks like this, you have worker unrest. 
So, you know, we're only about 15 or so years from uh, the Russian Revolution. The worker unrest strikes are happening, unemployment's high. The U.S. Embassy goes, oh, uh, there's some red storm clouds brewing over here. We need a real dickhead to make sure that this isn't going to turn into anything. Uh, Jorge Ubico, that's our guy. Um, and then they describe him in racist terms as being the white type, untainted by mixed blood, meaning the uh, mixed blood of the indigenous. He'll have no sympathies to uh, the plight of, you know, they're yeah. most oppressed. Yeah, most of the population. Yeah, or or that. That's a better way yeah, of putting it. Things, yeah. Oh, well, that's a that's a name right there. <laughs> that's a name that I think I've heard before. Real dickhead, I've heard. <laughs> Real prick bastard. Go ahead. With the blessing of the United States, Ubico came to power in 1931 through an election, quote unquote, in which he was the sole candidate. A staunch anti-communist and anti-intellectual, Yubiko embarked on a 13-year reign of autocratic rule over Guatemala, at times likening himself to Adolf Hitler. Quote, <laughs> quote, I am like Hitler. I execute first and ask questions later. That's a quote, not me saying that. American journalist John Gunther, who visited the country during 1941, described Guatemala as a country 100% dominated by a single man. And he, Ubico, has spies and agents everywhere and knows everyone's private business to an amazing degree. Um, it's a normal comparison to make about yourself. Um, you know what? In the 1930s, I bet you that there was far more people in the Western world saying things like that. Maybe people like Henry Ford, for example, might have made these kinds of um, glowing comparisons of themselves to Hitler. Um, I like the way I typed that out for some reason. Like it's like an, almost like a dead stop. Like at times, likening himself to Adolf Hitler. I'm like Hitler. <laughs> That's like how he said it. There was no ambiguity to it whatsoever. And yeah. also, um, it seems like Hitler um, reciprocated this appreciation for Ubico because this little news clipping here is pretty much uh, Hitler congratulating the president of Guatemala, being like from Germany, being in the 1930s, just being like, Ubico. Keep, keep going, man. <laughs> Oh, and Admiral Lochner, we did earlier talk about okay. uh, the the mestizo and like you know what that means and like you know the population within Guatemala. Uh, bro, these bananas peels are no joke. It ruined a revolution in Honduras. Come on, come also, on. Also, um, mestizo is actually interestingly a less common phrase in um, Guatemala. In Guatemala, they use the term ladino. Yeah almost like latino but it's with a d and i mean that's it's kind of like actually speaks to like what like the nature of latino is like uh, yeah ladino is the, the 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 european that essentially mixes with um indigenous no way come okay no pat look at this baldwin sent this i, I don't know if i can i zoom ah oh, yes was upset by a banana peel in San Barbara, Honduras earlier this month. The revolution was wrecked. According to Charles Morrison, coffee merchant of Puerto Barrios, Guatemala, who arrived here today, Morrison said General Martinez had told him his intention to start a revolution. Morrison was in Santa Barbara at the time. On March 17th, General Martinez appeared on the plaza in a brilliant uniform and shouting the signal for the uprising. Patriots of Honduras, follow me. Strode forward, then he stepped on a banana peel and he hit the ground. Two policemen fell upon him and hustled him to jail. He is still a prisoner. You gotta be fucking kidding me. That's gotta no. That's gotta be made up. I'm. I. I, ref, I refuse. I am refusing to believe that this is real. I've never. I think as a kid, I tried slipping on a banana peel, and it was like the it, most it, difficult it, thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. It's Mexican dope. What? This is an effective. Federalist rebels and tournament <laughs> leader. That was a different type of banana. <laughs> Confirm officers close to the Mexican Revolution. General Velasco, federal commander of Torrent. I know this is completely unrelated to what we're doing, but I just wanted to know like what they were talking about. Stronghold is taking a correspondent. Oh, okay. They're not talking about drugs at all. They're talking about like a dude and calling him a dope. There I think. Go. Which is funny. 
because I was like about to say like, oh my god, does does the 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 reefer madness paranoia go back that far? I mean, like yeah, I know it does, but you know what yeah. I mean. Do you want me to read this or do you want to keep eating? Um, yeah, read that, please. All right. Ubico's presidency came during a tumultuous period in Guatemala's history. The reverberations of the Great Depression had caused a collapse in the once lucrative coffee market and in turn bankrupted Guatemala's economy. Unemployment was rampant. The economic situation and the social consequences... We read it. What? Oh, shit. My bad. I'm so sorry. I am fucking up all over here. Uh, as president, Ubico unleashed a rabid campaign of communist persecution. Communism largely referring to any organization which advocated for humane working conditions or opposed the interest of UFCO and its subsidiaries. Guatemalan labor lawyer Mario Lopez Larave referred to this period as the long night of Gua Guatemalan labor and that the words trade union, strike, labor rights, petitions were legally prohibited. In addition to policing language, the Ubico regime also curated the literature that entered Guatemala to cull the pro proliferation of subversive ideas that could potentially inspire communist activity. During times of worker unrest, Ubico would routinely send in troops to violently quell the annoyance of impoverished workers. Um, I love that, like, in all these books that we pick up, the word subversive, like, always comes up. Like, choosing that name and then just being able to be like, look, they said it. They said it. They, they said, said the word. It look, it makes sense. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, like, there was that yeah. that breed of, to, to Sansamika's uh, comment, you know, about there was that, like, breed of banana that apparently, like, went extinct. And if you ever eat any kind of, like, candy that's supposed to taste like banana, what it's really trying to taste like is, like, that extinct... A uh, banana that died during some kind of like blight or something. Um. So yeah. So now you see Ubico just um, okay. You know, just start, whatever. So it's really acting like that real um like what the America what America really needs him to be like just um you know uh enforcing uh you know a, you know policing communist activity jailing people massacring striking workers all that good stuff is presented by Ubico. Ubico would continue the precedent. Of enforcing coercive labor, labor. Ubico would continue the precedent of enforcing coercive methods of forced labor, notoriously expanding this practice with his vagrancy law policy enacted in 1934. These vagrancy laws stipulated that any worker who owned less than two hectares of land would be mandated to a minimum of 100 days per year of manual labor. Failure to meet this requirement would result in arrest which in turn resulted in being forced to work as a rock breaker for road construction projects. Fear of labor conscription forced Indian laborers into hastily drawn plantation contracts. So this is a really, um, um, thank you. V. This is a, this is a really, um, sinister way of like effectively continuing this forced labor situation, um, where it's, you're essentially taking anyone that doesn't own land or even own enough land. If you do own less than two acres of land, you have to do a hundred days of labor. Right. Per manual labor. I mean, this. You, you had to carry around a log book and police could stop you and be like, do you have labor? And if you didn't, if you weren't fulfilling this, you would have to go into rock breaking crews, like chain gang rock breaking <laughs> crews. That's literally what yeah. was happening. Yeah. Um, and so think about that. So that meant that the the indigenous populations were pretty much running to plantations to just be like, okay, I guess you have to pay me whatever you want because if I don't do this, I'm pretty much going to be like in a chain gang breaking rocks for no money. So I guess I have to just work with whatever this plantation will give, give me. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of similar to a lot of that like post um, – slavery or I, I guess what we'll, i'll call it post 13th amendment policies that like you know for the uh people that were uh you know allegedly freed right they had to get jobs because suddenly these vagrancy laws were popping up and like you know if you were like homeless well, as a formally enslaved person it's hard for you to you know find a non-racist person willing to sell you land or a house or anything and you know you wind up 
arrested. You wind up in the prison system and then, you know. It's just slavery a, with extra steps. Exactly. It's just slavery with extra slavery. steps. This is just slavery with extra steps. It's That's all it really is at the end of the day. So, um, like, when you look at like this, like, oh, they abolished slavery in this year. It's like, did they? Did they, though? Yeah. Because <laughs> this feels pretty slavey to me. Yeah, I feel like, you know, a lot of it kind of just stayed the same. Yeah. Um, and uh, what the hell is this? Uh, the, yeah, the black coats. They did not. Um, and the banana I was talking about before is called the Gros Michel. They're not extinct. They're just not vi viable for commercial monoculture. And apparently you can still get them online, which, you know, I would love to do that one day and compare a Gros Michel to a candy flavored, uh, I mean, a banana flavored candy and see if it is really true. What? banana flavored flavored can like like laffy taffy isn't there like a like a banana laffy taffy yeah well i mean like it's technically yeah, I, it's a strong word but it's it's not my preferred laffy it's it's, taffy. it's not a preferred laffy taffy because it's it's a, it's trying to taste like something you've never had yeah but if i don't like it i don't like it what do you what do you think well, i mean it's I like or would you say that like strawberry flavored candy tastes like a strawberry it tastes good i'm just saying whether i like it or not <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing Banana runs. Yeah, I don't like those either. During this time, 70% of Guatemala's population was functionally illiterate, making it almost impossible to comprehend the contracts being con consummated, consummated by the Indian parties. This illiteracy was exploited by the landowners, and abuses were rampant. Yubiko would push the privileges of landowners even further as a as he signed a law in 1932 which effectively legalized the murder of plantation workers so long as the action was taken to protect their goods and lands again the u.s embassy astutely observed this dynamic the indian illiterate unshod diseased is the guatemalan laborer um, yeah, and I just, Jesus. just to keep everybody, uh, we've been pretty much furnishing this with like State Department embassy wires, uh, memos, studies that are conducted by Western organizations. So like all of this is being corroborated uh, by many, um, you know, Western institutions, if not the CIA or the State Department right. or the embassy itself. Right, and for, uh, for anybody that wants to make the argument like, oh, well, th that's just the Guatemalan people doing as the Guatemalan people do. Wrong. It's happening <laughs> under the auspices of an American company because they right. own fucking everything. They oh. own the farmland where this is happening. Anyone who's like, hey, I don't want this to happen anymore. They're like, all right, good luck. See you later. Like, you know what I mean? Like, right. so it's not like that this hasn't been pro protested because this what you're saying is like kind of like when somebody's like, wow, the Congo's messed up. Maybe those Congolese should get their shit together. You know what I mean? Right, like that's right. the very western paternalistic view that people have of these well, places where it's like well it's sad that they're like that <laughs> that's just happening because that's the way they want their country to be run maybe they should just like you know stop being corrupt yeah maybe they should just stop being corrupt maybe they should just you know do better deals make better business it's like wrong you're wrong you don't know what you're talking about right, you have like, who are they corrupt to <laughs> who are they corrupt for right right Let's who <laughs> Who ensures the continued corruption, right? Yeah. Like, well, Who incentivizes the corruption. You can't be corrupt for no better. Who is the one that's who's like rewarding the corruption? Valuable. Yeah. It's like, oh, 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 oh the, that, that is, that goes against my surface level, you know, knowledge of these things in these faraway places. I don't know anything about. Bro, please, uh, please, bro. All right. So here's a little bit more information on that. That the way that I actually summarized in my own writing the the execution policy, I think I actually may have been a little bit lenient on it because this with this this from Wikipedia makes it sound even worse. So, uh, Yubiko had made statements supporting the labor movement when he campaigned for presidency, but after his election, his policy quickly became authoritarian. He abolished the system of debt peonage. Oh, okay, that sounds good, and replaced it with a vagrancy law, which required all men of working age who did not own land to perform a minimum of a hundred days of hard labor. Is that supposed huh. to be like better than debt peonage? He's like, guys, I know everybody hates debt peonage. I got just the I, thing. Trust me, <laughs> I'm going to fix it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> in addition, the state made use of unpaid Indian labor to work on public infrastructure like roads and railroads. Huh. This is what I meant as, as a consequence of not completing your 100 days of labor. 
Ubico also froze wages at a very low level and passed a law allowing landowners complete immunity from persecution for any action they took to defend their property, an action described by historians as legalizing murder. <laughs> Jesus he greatly Christ. strengthened the police force, turning it into one of the most efficient and ruthless in Latin America. The police were given greater authority to shoot and imprison people suspected of breaking labor laws. The result of these laws was to create tremendous resentment against him among agricultural laborers. Ubico was highly contemptuous of the country's indigenous population people once stating that they resemble donkeys um what? also he's like he's like adolf hitler um so so i think uh, he also had like a bust of napoleon in his office also of course um, yeah so he i think he was he, he was big on mussolini also so yeah so this is just more of the situation here just kind of repaint glossing over this uh forced labor laws racism right. legalizing murder militarizing the police force and this is who the united states is like man he's he's real white this is a good white I, guy this is, i fucking love is. that guy they're, not, <laughs> hey, they're, they're really not wrong i mean other than the good part but um they're not wrong in saying like man this guy's really cut from our cloth this is really <laughs> our kind of guy this is really our kind of guy down there in guatemala he's doing just what we need to oh i mean like you know it, it's interesting that you say that like he kind of adopted like um working class you know nebulous vague like aesthetics yeah. or talking points right and then like the second you know <laughs> fuck welcome <laughs> the the second he's in office it's just like gotcha bitch <laughs> he was like dude i said i would end debt peonage and i'm replacing it I, with this worst thing <laughs> with this <laughs> worse for you better for me actually <laughs> see what else we got here good despite enforcing strict austerity measures i love that word um in average guatemala on average guatemalans ubico would use his political power to enrich himself at the expense of the nation 1944 u.s intelligence reports reveal ubico quote became the greatest private landowner in guatemala and would buy many properties at a price fixed by himself whoa what there's surely there is no conflict of interest there not only did ubico ensure his salary and prerequisites were generously increased while he slashed bureaucrats salaries in 1940 he gifted himself two hundred thousand dollars from congress a u.s minister reported that some 90 persons in guatemala have been put in jail for speaking out of turn regarding this gift how much is two hundred thousand dollars worth in nineteen forty four? All like, right, oh, time oh, time to break out the fucking inflation calculator. All right, so we're going for uh, January nineteen forty. Or does it say what month he did it in? Doesn't matter, dude. Just January. Wh whatever. Fucking. And it was two hundred thousand. Two hundred k. Yeah. A two hundred. One two three. Okay, so about uh, four, what is that, million? Oh, $328,633.09. Like, because like, living in the 21st century, you're here 200,000, you're like, ah, you know, people probably break off 200,000 all the time. You know what I mean? Like that, you know. <laughs> Come on. Yeah, and, you know. A little 200K, that's nothing. Come yeah. on. And not only that, this is also in Guatemala. This is in the United right. States. This, this is... Point is like <laughs> well, he, i think says or i remember reading at one point that like 89 dollars was like the yearly income of people in guatemala and that's about one thousand <laughs> yeah like, you know it's absolutely absurd so at the same time where he's like we need austerity you know what i mean we you know we just have no choice you know we have to uh you know slave for the united fruit company and uh you know we're just gonna have to tighten our belt loops a little bit meanwhile he's like i'm just gonna take 4.3 million that's yeah that's for, that's for me that's just a little present yeah. for me it's my birthday's coming up yeah all right so we've uh, established ubico here as a real dickhead <laughs> uh, guatemala was dealing with before the revolution just an we referring to now s rank dickhead because guatemala's political climate political climate grew more unstable, Ubico would respond with a commensurate level of repression. 
Due to worsening economic conditions and excessive government overstep, political unrest spread from the indigenous peasants to include university students and middle class citizens. This is important. This is important in a lot of uh, in a lot of revolutions because you can always go to like the rural areas where the people are the most immiserated and the most impoverished, and they're like, "Yeah, we fucking hate the government." If you're a government and it spreads from those people to middle class people, you know your days are you you you, the, you, you clock it out. Those are, those are the people that are at least one to two paychecks away from being like the the lower lower class, right? That you got. You got some breathing room with them, you know? Yeah. The, the, the political crime is a great Freudian slip. <laughs> um, so, uh, so now we have the unrest spreading from the indigenous populations to students and the middle class, which is not good if you're a dictator. No. In response to the mounting pressure, Yubiko declared martial law in 1944. Demonstrations against the president persisted despite protesters being gunned down by Yubiko's forces. As tensions mounted, Yubiko's iron grip on Guatemala grew increasingly tenuous. Faced with insurmountable resistance, Yubiko and the United States recognized the writing on the wall and he submitted his resignation. While this would elicit exuberant celebration from Guatemalan citizens, democracy was yet to be achieved. Martian so, law? Ver <laughs> better than that. No, I don't think he did. I think they're just making jokes. We're all having fun. We're all having fun here. And yeah, that's a that's a great uh, quote, I think, from Animal House. You know, while I'm currently lower upper, I aspire to be middle middle. <laughs> Asociación de Estudiantes University. Students organizing against you, Biko. Yeah, when you got like university students like you know organizing against you, but... well, also it's the white population. Now. Yeah, <laughs> and this you could say this about the United States also. Black people have been organizing. And being like, Yo, this shit is fucked up, and it needs to stop for like the entirety of black people in the United States. And it wasn't until like the 1960s where where white people started being like, "Hey, yeah," and they're like, "All right, fine, it's got to change." I was close though. It was from Weekend at Bernie's, not Animal <laughs> House. Um, yeah, no. Um, so in his departure, uh, I'm assuming Wait, it I had to look twice. This is another guy. And I was like, is that, is that you Biko? That's another guy. Not, different person. If oh. you look up, both, they look strikingly similar. I'm sorry. I guess all them white Guatemalans just kind of look alike. I don't, yeah. I don't know. Unless you just put on a different hat and it's like, Hey, <laughs> I'm i I'm a different guy. Just grow a mustache, wear a different hat and you're good. In his departure, Ubico appointed a military... And I always think it's, it's Junta, right? I say Junta. Maybe Sebs or something. I've heard people say it's it's Junta or, or pronounce it Junta. And I'm like, I, that doesn't sound right. I feel like Junta is the way to say it. The same way it's like, you know, people debate, like, is it Juche? Or is it, is it Juchi? Juche? Junta is what I hear. Right, right yeah. Junta. It's Junta, right? Yeah. All right. Junta comprised of... You never pronounce the J. That, that, that's the standard I was operating on. Also. Right, right. Junta. Junta. I read one of our Spanish speakers. All right, thank you. All right, thank you. Yubico appointed a military junta uh, comprised of three generals to run the country until elections could be held. Of these generals, Federico Ponce uh, would persuade Congress to appoint him interim president. According to an eyewitness, the electors would have been wiped out by the machine guns had they refused his claim to presidency. Ponce claimed free elections would be held in short order, but contradicted his gesture of goodwill by suppressing protests and suspending freedom of the press. The revolutionary fervor of Guatemala would not be satiated with such a lukewarm pr compromise. And by this point, even progressive elements in the military became disillusioned with Ponce. With even the military subverted, the final nail in the old order's coffin would be laid. I love that it stopped Gringo. Uh, had the chat things right. Like Gringo isn't even really a derogatory yeah. like term. Like that's not like, how racism works. Yeah, and it, well, not only that, it, 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 like there's um like Wero is like a far more like derogatory right. term. Like somebody from like Mexico or something. Gringo yeah. is like a very neutral term to call an American. Yeah. Well, it does on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm about to get banned. I'm, we're about to get banned. Oh, hash. Thank, thank you, you. Hashkish, for the bits. Yeah. All right. So just, just, just one more time, chat, or for anybody that's just kind of lurking in there. All right. I know that like we're we're throwing around some some fun, you know, terms. You know, 
um, you cannot be racist against white people because, right? Uh, name me a place. Name me a place where white people are not at the top of the social pecking order. Name me a place. All right. You tell me this for the first time. <laughs> no, 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 no. Not, not. We're not talking Mars, right? All right, fine. China. You even then, right? You can get a job in China, right? My old boss, right, was from China, where I could just get paid handsomely for just being a white guy, right? Reading off of Google Slides, much like what I'm doing here, right? For for companies in China. What? I can do that. Yeah, dude. You can you can move to China and get a job. Just I I I don't know if the tattoo will help you. Maybe just a little bit of foundation will help you out. But like, you could just read like you know fucking like Google slide presentations for companies in China. And because you're a white guy, they'll be like, oh yeah, that's great. No, I love this. They got a white guy. English reign oh. supreme, Hortis, control of the financial. Slavic people are not at the top because that is where the word slave comes from. The Slavic. I don't know about that. I would probably want to look a little bit more into the into that before, you know, agreeing with you. Racism about the ability to access the law and legal system being called insulting words is not racism. There you go. Good enough. All right, yeah, moving on. Various plots to overthrow Ponce were being conceived, but the coup devised by another trio of military men would come to fruition. Francisco Arana, Aldana Sandoval, and Jacobo Arbenz would be joined by progressive army factions, radical students, and unionists. Throughout the night, weapons were distributed to a volunteer civilian army two to 3,000 strong. Arbenz illustrates the coup preparation in a letter to his wife. All the players will soon be in place. The civilians have confidence in me. They support us. I think you're going to enjoy what is in store. We are almost ready and we will strike decisively. I have been authorized to form a de facto government. We will call elections for a constituent assembly and then presidential elections, both of which will be completely free. We will have written a brilliant and patriotic chapter in our history. The coup was met with resistance as Ponce desperately attempted to retain power but after just one day of fighting, he would surrender unconditionally and fled the country with Ubico by his side. Ubico actually died in New Orleans. That's where he went after. Wow. Yeah, he lived the rest of his life in New Orleans. Did he die in Katrina? That would be sick, but I don't know. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so this is the fall. You know, there's Ubico. Ubico is dislodged from power by a popular uprising. They kind of try to do like a real quick, like, you know, uh, replacement like oh yeah we know you guys were having here's here's Ponce and uh you know they did a lot of really coercive of things to get him into power he turned out that he was going to be like pretty much just like a surrogate of Ubico and then the actual progressive um leftist forces in the country had a coup on top of the coup to now usher in there is again a three-man military junta which but they are promising free elections so let's see how that goes <laughs> <laughs> He's, the, the Wilco's little quips here should just be put as our channel description. They should just be our. Uh, they should just be like just, what our channel description. Just retitling is. the episodes. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck! Look at this pencil are, thin mustache. Yeah. Here are the three individuals not responsible for because it was the population. It was the popular sentiment of Guatemala that was responsible, but it was headed by these three men from the military, or actually two of them are from the military, Arbenz and Arana. Uh, Jorge Toriello is actually from the um, the protest movement. It's also funny that the revolution happens in October. It's called the October Revolution, yeah. Um, I don't know what it is about October and revolutions. but P People just lose their shit in October, man. I was born in October. I'm imbued. You're imbued with that revolutionary fervor. Mm -hmm. An unprecedented optimism enveloped the nation following the ousting of Federico, uh, Federico Ponce. A spirit of unity traversed the rigid social strata which traditionally uh, dictated the political mechanisms of Guatemala. 
Urban workers, middle-class citizens, landowners, and members of the military rejoiced in the hope of a new Guatemala. The jubilant atmosphere was confirmed by a U.S. military station that reported revolutionary troops and civilians continue to maintain order with full popular cooperation. Ponce's vacancy would be temporarily filled by yet another junta comprised of military men, this time consisting of the progenitors of the coup, Jacobo Arbenz and Francisco Arana. With the addition of a central part of the protest movement, Jorge Torriello, the junta, the junta uh, would immediately propose free elections to enshrine a legitimate president, the formation of a formidable Congress, as well as the immediate abolition of institutionalized torture. So there's the uh, the junta that obviously is serves as like a stand-in for the elections that would soon come, and they make all of these very progressive proclamations. We're going to abolish institutionalized torture. We're going to make a new uh, uh, we're going to make a new constitution, and we're going to have free elections for the first time in Guatemala's history. As promised. The elections were arranged for December 1944, roughly two months from the overthrow of Ubico. As a gesture of authenticity, none of the junta members would run for the presidency themselves. The middle class nature of the revolution, which was spearheaded by the student movement, had a great deal of influence on the upcoming election. As a result, famed Guatemalan intellectual Juan Jose Arevalo became a strong candidate in the upcoming election. The scholarly Aravalo held a doctorate degree in philosophy and was the author of several acclaimed books. <clears throat> this academic status garnered a great deal of popularity among the Guatemalan citizenry. Aravalo symbolized an optimistic evolution in Guatemalan politics, which was usually reserved exclusively for despotic military men. Aravalo spent the majority of Ubico's notorious reign exiled in Argentina, which further solidified his support as the public considered him untainted by ubiquismo. Ubiquismo. But the time ballots were by the time ballots were tallied, Aravalo would dominate the election, winning 85% of the vote vote. Only literate men were permitted to vote at this time, just for the ah, record. There. An American university study group referred to the election as the first free election in Guatemala's history. Um, so hold on. Don't click. So um you have here uh so you have this military junta who's technically in power that allows these elections to happen. And as a, this, this show of authenticity, none of the junta members run. None of them insert themselves into the election. They allow other candidates to run. And this revolution that they're having here is more than just like a coup. It is a change in like a paradigm shift in like the... In, in the Guatemalan political culture. Whereas the entirety of the independent national history of Guatemala, there has never been a like non-military affiliated pr president. So once Ubico and Ponce are thrown away, the people of Guatemala are yearning for something different. And they're looking at these, this intellectual, this teacher, he has a degree in philosophy and all these things. And also he was outside of, um, Guatemala for most of Ubico because he was exiled for having subversive thoughts. Um, so he's not tainted by the stain of Ubico. He's not associated with him in any way. So that's why this is um, so important and why he was so popular in the uh, among the Guatemalan citizenry. And it was said by an American university study group that this was the first free election in Guatemala's history. There's um, there's Juan Jose Arevalo, just and some nerd who he got two hundred and thirty thousand more just votes. Than. Low energy. Oh wait, he he was part of the Fupa party. <laughs> I mean that's I didn't, I didn't that's even why. Know. Like you know, if I if I see the Fupa party, you know, I'm voting. I'm voting. Arevalo's inauguration would mark the beginning of a new era in Guatemalan politics, characterized by social and economic reform. Arevalo launched his administration extolling peace, social prosperity, emphasis on education, and above all, democracy. Arevalo referred to himself as a socialist, but rejected the traditional forms of Marxism. Arevalo espoused his own brand of spiritual socialisms, which champions generous social programs yet retaining capitalist production. The National Assembly ratified the new constitution 
immediately after Aravala was inaugurated, which contained over 60 provisions strengthening the democratic processes, in initiating social reform and establishing government welfare programs. The new constitution granted suffrage to all adults aside from illiterate women and enshrined freedom of speech, press, and assembly. Freedom of political organization was also legalized. Although the Communist Party remained illegal, Arvalo's con new constitution would be the first in Guatemala's history to include protection for laborers, including minimum wage and specific child labor laws, while also abolishing Ubico's notorious vagrancy laws and any other forms of forced labor practices. Liberal commentators would exalt the new constitution as the most enlightened in Latin America. So Aravalo is an extremely progressive individual who would essentially be like a social democrat of today in the way that he's like okay with like leaving the means of production in the hands of the bourgeois as long as we can like have that under undercut by a lot of very generous social programs. He's okay with labor laws, but he doesn't go too far. He yeah. doesn't describe himself as a Marxist. Communist Party is still illegal. He takes an okay step and makes uh, women be able to vote, but as long as they're literate. So there's still a, I don't know if you remember just maybe a, a decade or so ago, like 70% of Guatemala's right. population is illiterate. So so, uh, so pretty much you know. it's, it's only upper class, probably white, exactly. literate exactly. women that this are allowed to vote. This is not the beacon. This is not the end all be all. Is this a great step from Ubico? without a doubt yeah i'm actually very favorable to aravalo i think that he was actually a pretty great guy well i mean like if you're you know fucking your two options are hitler <laughs> guatemalan <laughs> hitler <Bernie Sanders laughs> versus like not even guatemalan bernie sanders is more like guatemalan fucking like you know joe as, biden. I, sure yeah joe well, biden i guess like i don't i don't even know i was trying to think of somebody even before fdr but i just couldn't think Art, of anything no, no not jimmy carter right um yeah so but you Warren, know he, i don't know Warren. <laughs> <laughs> just question mark like everybody's like i guess um but yeah so um obama so Fuck. this guy you know a lot of great things that he pushed through a lot of labor laws um you know helped a lot in education let's go for it i described okay 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 I don't have to sit here and try to restate it. Aravala would expand and improve the Ministry of Public Health, a venture intended to provide higher quality medical care to the more remote areas of Guatemala's highlands. Indigenous populations in the remote areas suffered immensely due to lacking access to adequate medical care. Prior to the revolution, Guatemala boasted the highest infant mortality rate in Latin America at 40% and 60% in rural areas primarily caused by preventable ailments such as measles, parasites, malnutrition, and whooping cough. Applied to Guatemala's dismal infrastructure, even these modest efforts resulted in a 2.5 decrease in mortality per year from 1944 to 1954, which are the years of the Guatemalan Revolution. So it's like literally um, a coin toss as to whether your kid is going to make it or not. Exactly. So if you, yeah, and, and if you live in the rural areas of the country, it's worse than a coin toss. Right. It's like uh, uh, two coin tosses. <laughs> if you live in the greatest, most affluent area of Guatemala City, it's still 40%. Right. If you're out in the, in the highlands, it's 60%. And this is all due to preventable uh, disease also that very, very, even once you just do like the minimal effort of getting healthcare out, you're seeing a 2.5 decrease in mortality per year for the entire 10 years of the right. revolution. So, yeah, so, you know, Aravalo continues, uh, making, um, <laughs> 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 trying to think of a U.S. president with even a little left sentiment is hard. Um, yeah. So, you know, we see a little bit more of Aravalo, you know, being kind of like a very social democratic guy working on healthcare and having good results with it as well. And also we learn a little bit more about just how fucked up Guatemala was. And I mean, it still is in many, but like, Definitely. Just enough, this is one of the most troubled places in Latin America at this time. And, and, and remember that like most of the labor is coming from the poorest, most rural yes. areas yes. and they make up the majority of the population. Which means mm -hmm. that, like, these people are having mad fucking kids, and half of them are dying. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And from things that could be treated, like, easily. Right. Like, they don't have to die. So, am I reading this one? I forget. 
True to his intellectual foundation, Arevalo would prioritize massive improvements to Guatemala's education system. This overhaul would be sorely needed, as prior to the revolution, 70% of Guatemalans were functionally illiterate, a rate that soared to 90 within indigenous communities. The Arevalo administration would institute the National Literary Committee and developed over 6,000 learning centers throughout Guatemala including normal schools, tech schools, night schools for adults, industrial centers, rural schools, etc. Between 1945 and 1950, government expenditures for education swelled by 155%. Wow, Ubico like really just did not give a shit. Like how are you going to how are you going to embezzle 4. <laughs> <Yeah>. mil <laughs> education? Like what the fuck? How's that supposed? How you you do the math there, like, <laughs> How the fuck am I supposed to do that? How are you supposed to give yourself a nice little birthday present of 4.3 mil if, like, you know, you're trying to also fund education? Sam, um, I, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but the, uh, that's the current indigenous population. I'm pretty sure back at this time, the indigenous was actually the the, the majority. Um, I don't think, I think it was actually, the, the population was, like, b multiple percentage points higher at this point. Can, can you give me a minute? Because I, I got to get something. Uh, I'm dying here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here, let's see if we can bring that up then while while, while Johnny's... Are you, you going to be long? All right, whatever. Um, so let's see. What was the indigenous population of Guatemala in 1945? Okay, maybe I'll... Oh, no, that's 2018 census. Hmm... trying to see here i thought it was like 80 percent, so i had to look it up yeah I, I don't know if you were here uh for this but we talked about it in the beginning the current population of guatemala is 40 percent indigenous and then in places like shella which is the second largest city in uh guatemala it has 60 percent indigenous so like outside of the capital and probably antigua um you know you're gonna find a lot of uh majority uh indigenous populations outside of the major cities I'm trying to see if I can, I'm trying to find like a, uh, over time, um, indigenous population of Guatemala history. Um, anybody else can help with that. I would appreciate it. Um, man, let's see if maybe there's something in the images. Yeah, I, I, I want to say that my mom's from the city, considered white. My dad came from a more rural area. Yeah, uh, that's that's pretty common as well. I have a friend that I stayed with in uh, Guatemala City who is uh, Guatemalan in terms of his heritage, but um, is uh, considered, they call him white Amalan. Uh, they call him white Amalans uh, for the more um, European blooded, so to speak. Let's see. Indigenous. What? Did you read it already? No, no, no. no. I was trying. I'm, okay, so you're back. Yeah. I'm trying to find if I could find a percentage of uh, indigenous people in Guatemala, like not current, but like back in like the 1940s um, or the early 20th century. But I just couldn't find it. It was really annoying. Um, so I gave up, and, and I'm glad you're back. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm sure you could find, um, if you're quoting Glad Jesus, like, I I'm certain that he, like, you know, has his shit backed up, you know, with some kind of sources cited in, uh, uh, Any from him specifically about that. I didn't have that in the slide. Oh, okay. Nobody was, like, challenging it. It's just that I didn't have, I only had the current population, not the, um, not not the historical i would i wanted to see the, if there was like a trend in the historical population of indigenous people that have de has decreased uh, over time right i believe that's the case i believe i read that but i don't have anything to actually substantiate it at this point but what i do have is this book which is one of my favorite books that i read on guatemala the cia in guatemala um 
not very mysterious in the title. Um, <laughs> it, it, uh, very straightforward. And what's it about? <laughs> yeah, what what could it potentially be about? But this is a great, you know, relatively small book that someone could read that really, really just details um, the Guatemalan Revolution, then also the CIA response. So an excerpt of that, um, well, coming in one moment. Even with the massive expansions in labor, medical, and educational sectors, Guatemala remained a severely racist society. Aravalo's administration recognized the historic circumstances which marginalized and stigmatized Guatemala's Mayan population. Part of Aravalo's national program would include a number of policies which tackled the exceptional plight of the indigenous communities. Historian Richard Immerman details, within the first six months of his administration, Aravalo formed the National Indian Institute in order to introduce the isolated Maya to modern developments without forcing alien ways upon them. The Institute studied the characteristics that defined each tribe, statistically analyzed the rural nutrition of the country, founded the first regional rural schools based on social, economic, and linguistic factors, published maps of the various linguistic groupings, and investigated the social organizations, economies, customs, politics, and religions of the diverse communities. In an effort to gauge the impact of Arabalo's policies in rural, rural Mayan communities, a journalist traveled extensively in the Guatemalan highlands, canvassing the Maya's reactions to the reforms. He reported this repeated response. Now we are free. We are equal to the Ladinos. Now no one can force us to work on coffee plantations far away against our will. We will only go if we want to. Um, so, you know, uh, uh, according to this source, Aravalo took a very, pretty progressive view toward the indigenous communities and 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 did his best to um, develop them, but also not infringe upon them chauvinistically. And if we believe this book and the journalist who uh, gauged the reactions of the Mayas, they seemed resoundingly pretty pleased with what he was doing. Do you want me to read this since you're eating? Yeah. To oversee his plan of reform, Aravalo invited the American-based International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, that is the IBRD. This is very important. Remember this, the IBRD. is. Remember that the IBRD is actually like a wing of the World Bank. It is a Western financial institution. Just keep that in mind and don't forget that acronym, IBRD. To tour the country and provide policy recommendations. Economist George Britnell concluded that under existing circumstances, the state must assume the major role in the advancement of the underdeveloped segments of the Guatemalan economy. Aravalo heeded the advice of the leading economists of the IBRD and initiated a nascent program of agrarian reform to transform Guatemala from an impoverished agricultural-based economy to a state of industrialized modernity. Aravalo was well aware of the potential stigma associated with land reform endeavors. Policies of nationalization and redistribution would come under heavy scrutiny of the international community. And by the international community, I mean the United States. I don't know. I think I just <laughs> memed, memed myself there a little bit um, when I was writing this because isn't that like a meme where it's like when they say international community and it's like what they mean and it's like it shows the whole world but it only shows like six countries as like the international community it's like when a band um, goes on a world tour and it's just like i think i mean i think i memed myself a little bit um so sorry as well as likely to be met with rigid opposition from the wealthy landowning class of guatemala Despite these factors, Aravalo did, nevertheless, lay the groundwork for the 1952 Agrarian Reform Bill, and in doing so, dramatically altered the course of Guatemala's social, economic, and political development. Um, yeah, um, so the IBRD. They come and they look around Guatemala and they're like, oh wow, shit's fucked up here. They say, the state must assume the major role in the advancement of the underdeveloped segments of the Guatemala economy. So you have this Western institution, a, a, a appendage of the World Bank, coming into Guatemala and being like, you know, the state needs to do something here because things are not good. I too many that, too many dead kids. I'm stepping over too many dead, dead babies here. Yeah, something needs to happen here. So Aravalo says that and he's like, all right, all right, let's, let's start doing something there. What could go wrong? We ask ourselves, let's continue. During Truman's presidency, a new ambassador to Guatemala would be appointed in 1948, Richard Patterson. Patterson, a hard-nosed, what the fuck does that mean, anti-communist, would flatly state in his intentions his job was 
to protect and promote American interests in Guatemala, and that these interests had been persecuted, prosecuted, and unmercifully kicked around over the past two years, and that personally, I was fed up and the patience of my government nearly exhausted. Patterson would reiterate these intentions in a letter to UFCO President Sam, the Banana Man Zamoray. Jesus Christ. Have you heard of this guy? No, I've never fucking heard of it. Sam, Sam, the the, Man. Sam the Banana Man Zamoray. That's the, UFC, that's the United Fruit Company president. Sam the Banana Man. Wow. With the present severe political instability in this country and the persecution of American interests, my suggestion is that there that there be an all-out barrage in the U.S. Senate on the bad treatment of American capital in Guatemala. This takes the onus off of the UFCO and puts it on the basis of a demand by our senators that all American interests be given a fair deal. Arevalo stated of Patterson, You do not have an ambassador of the U.S. here, but a representative of United Fruit. So, Truman, we all know the difference between Truman and FDR. Um, Truman comes in, the ambassador to Guatemala changes to this guy, staunch anti-communist, who comes in and immediately is like, and just so you know, that I added the emphasis for all-out barrage in the U.S. Senate. Uh, that was that was a emphasis by the author added. So um, saying that, oh, these past two years, the two years of the Aravalo administration, where there's just like very reasonable uh, uh, labor laws and, and land reform suggestions that are actually coming from the behest of a uh, large Western institution the uh, from the World Bank, um, this guy comes in and is like, nope, that's it. We're not going to stand for it. We're persecuted. We're prosecuted. We're abused. We're exploited. He's talking about the United Fruit Company being exploited. I don't know if you guys remember all the statistics that we talked about earlier, where they are like virtu a virtual tyrannical overseer of right. the Guatemalan slave colony for the purpose of resource extraction and uh, exploitation. You pick up the phone, you're picking up a UFCO owned line. You're right? on a you're on a train you're on a ufco it's, train it's a banana train that happened to let people on it right exactly like because yeah. you know like we talked about in the beginning any development any kind of economic development that has happened in guatemala thus far is purely for the the extraction of natural resources right or labor of the people yeah. within guatemala so, and you have here a pretty damning little letter here between him and the president of UFCO. It seems weird that there's a lot of collusion going on with the UFCO and the ambassador to the United States from Guatemala, who's pretty much saying, um, this is the most damning part of it, is that um, with the present severe political instability in this country and the persecution of American interests, my suggestion is that there be an all out barrage in the US Senate on the bad treatment of American capital in Guatemala. This takes the onus off the UFCO and puts it on the basis of demand by our senators, saying that I recognize that this is your plight here, but we're gonna do this and it's gonna throw the scent off. He's pretty much saying that and no ambiguous with no ambiguity whatsoever that he's like, this takes the onus off of this company and it makes it seem like it's not the company um, repressing a political movement. Right. Now we can rebrand this as an American campaign against communism. Right. Well, I mean, it's not that much different from anything that goes on here in the U.S. Just like, you know, the strike that was, you know, uh, uh, made illegal this past Christmas or any of the stuff going on with trains in the country where like, you know, all of these congressmen and senators are all like, you know, fucking ganked up on fucking uh, 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 Norfolk Southern stock, right? Or yeah. Elizabeth Warren making sure that like, you know, when Congress was uh, trying to, to uh, set up any kind of like new deal, you know, with Medicare, Medicaid, right? And medical device companies, well, her daughter sits on the board of a medical device company and, sh and she yeah. made sure that like they would not have any undue changes, you know, with their agreement with the state government. The last thing he said, can you go back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, the last thing he said is, you do not have an ambassador of the U.S. here, but a rep of the United Fruit. And I believe it was uh, uh, Sam, uh, um, Sam Alica, Solidarity Hour. I'm sorry what the name is. But um, this is a question that I think was being asked before. So let's move forward now. 
Go ahead, Johnny. Aravalo's conflation of UFCO representatives with the U.S. state officials would not be without merit. John Foster Dulles, <laughs> fucking Secretary of State, formerly represented UFCO as a lawyer instrumental in Ubico era concessions to company. Alan Dulles, brother of John Foster Dulles, CIA director, also a lawyer, represented financial companies in Guatemala, worked closely with IRCA. John Cabot, Assistant Secretary of State, former ambassador to Guatemala, substantial UFCO stockholder. Thomas Cabot, now that sounds like they're related, Director of Office of International Security Affairs, former Director, President of UFCO. Sinclair Weeks, Secretary of Commerce, former Director of First National Bank of Boston. Boston, leading financier of UFCO. Robert Cutler, National Security Advisor, Board Chairman of UFCO. John J. McCloy, Presidential Advisor and UFCO Director. Ann Whitman, President's Personal Secretary, Ex-Wife of UFCO Vice President. I assume there's some kind of, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it when you divorce somebody and they're depending on that check from you after you divorce them? Alimony involved there. Robert Hill, Ambassador to Costa Rice actively yeah. oh is it costa rica yeah all right costa rica actively participated in cia planning future director of ufco walter bedell smith served as head of cia assumed position at ufco immediately after resigning his government position in 1954 immediately following the cia coup he helped organize whitney shepherdson Council on Foreign Relations and IRCA officer Robert Lehman. Why does that name sound so fucking familiar? Coun sure. Council of Foreign Relations served on UFCO board. So here we have just like what seems to be an impossible list of individuals who are, uh, you know, incestuously associated between the United Fruit Company and uh, the U.S. State Department in one way or the other. Um, so, you know, this, this suspicion, and this is an interesting thing because there's kind of a debate in Guatemalan politics, um, or Guatemalan history between, ah. the, between these two books. Um, there's bitter, bitter fruit and shattered hope. And, um, oh, do you have something? Sorry. I, I didn't mean to, to break you off, but I, if this is the same guy, I mean, he would have to be ancient for it to be the same guy, right? Well, he was born in 1891. Holy shit. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it could definitely be this. But he died in 1969. How was he part of the 08 financial? Uh, do, 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 do. Is there anything in here about, like, what, what else did he do? Somebody just said something about the 08 financial crisis. Council of Foreign Relations served on UFCO. So let me see if UF... No. It could be, though. I mean, it might not be on this specifically. True. Uh, Robert Lehman guided his company through the perils of the stock market crash of 1929 and his during the Great Depression. He met the financial needs of his clients international and made himself one of the wealthiest people in the United States. Real quick before we get too far away. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I'm sorry. I just wanted to see if it was the same guy. Wow, I love books through bars. I actually volunteer there. Uh, I will be there for my orientation on April 6th. So if you see me there and you feel comfortable, uh, say what's up. Um, and I will be uh, volunteering there. And also, this is a good time. If anybody's here uh, and you're interested, we uh, if you look down there in the bottom right corner, there's a donate to charity button. Um, if anybody wants to donate to Books Through Bars, it is a nonprofit here in Philadelphia, which um, uses funds to purchase books and get them into the hands of incarcerated individuals um, who may not otherwise be able to get their, their hands on literature. So expanding the education, and the recreation and the mental health and lowering the recidivism rate um, of incarcerated individuals by providing them literature. If anybody wants to throw a dollar into it, um, it will go to a very, very good cause. Also, hello to uh, Tetsu Kopadeo. Hope you're hello enjoying. You. Yeah. Hi. Very nice to meet you. Okay, so I think we've established here firmly. Okay, so back to what I was saying here. Um, that. These two books actually take a, like a conch. This one was written first, Bitter Fruit. Bitter Fruit 
is um, very much about that the United Fruit Company was the one responsible for the coup in Guatemala. Chinero Glejesus says uh, it says that that United Fruit got it wrong. It, it, what Piero says is that it doesn't matter. The UFCO could have never existed. That this was all just part of United States Cold War policy. It was all about a witch hunt of communism. Um, and he states that that the conclusions of bitter fruit are incorrect. Um, Thank you for the donation, to... Patek King. Thank you so much, Patek King. Um, now, I, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not trying to, you know... I've read these and I don't understand why it can't be both. Like it's it's obvious that these two things are like inextricably twined together. The political structure, right. the hunt, for, the, the 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 witch hunt of communism, and uh, that that exists between private interests and um, America's geopolitical campaign of the Cold War. A little bit of calm, a, a little bit of calm, B. Exactly. Best thing you can do in prison is read. Absolutely yep. right. So here, uh, motivated by repeated complaints from the UFCO, the U.S. State Department ordered the embassy to conduct a report on whether the UFCO was indeed the victim of discrimination in Guatemala. The finding of the report are well summarized in a memorandum by Undersecretary of State Robert Lovett. This is, I didn't want to read the whole thing, but there's just a couple important parts here. So um, the United States, the United Fruit Company is telling the United States, we're being discriminated against. We're being discriminated against. Like, this is unfair. They're, they're taking land. They're, 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 there's labor laws. So just these highlighted parts. So officers of the United Fruit Company, so the State Department with counsel and officers of the United Fruit Company, it was agreed between the department and the company that the company would gather and present evidence to the department to whether the, there were enterprises besides the United Fruit Company. Then down, it says, it was only on December 9th, 1948, that the company was able to present to the department sufficient information, right? And then it goes down and says, uh, review to renew representations in protection of the United Fruit Company's interests. And at the end, it says that it was proven and the case of the United Fruit Company will be vigorously pressed. So, Thank you so, so much, Maverick, for the $20 donation. Uh, we are now at $100 of the thousand that we hope to raise. We're one-tenth of the way there. Thank you so much. So let's go forward. There's a summary of this that is, that is good. Um, so the investigation in which the United Fruit Company had been its own prosecutor and the jury had been a most sympathetic embassy had proven through evidence provided by the United Fruit Company that the United Fruit Company was discriminated, discriminately targeted by Aravalo's labor code in stark contradiction to the previous Ambassador Kyle's 1948 conclusion. Less than a month later, UFCO protested by firing a large number of employees and halting all shipping from Puerto Barrios. Reminder, Puerto Barrios contains the only deep water port on Guatemala's Caribbean coast and right. is absolutely essential for international trade. Aravalo responded by threatening to sequester UFCO properties. The conflict would reach an anticlimactic resolution as UFCO refused to participate in labor union arbitrations, but raised employee wages by less than 10%. While a Guatemalan newspaper, El Imparcial, summarized this dispute that it is clear that our country is too weak to challenge powerful American business interests. So, um, in the, if you remember like those highlighted parts in that um, undersecretary memorandum, um, it's pretty much saying like, we will hear out the officers of the United Fruit Company. So the United Fruit Company is the ones that are effectively being like, here's the evidence of our own discrimination. Right. And the United States and Embassy is like, wow, this is very convincing. Uh, let's pursue this. So We're so sorry that happened to you. We won't, yeah, exactly. we won't let those Guatemalans hurt you anymore. Um, so then there's a little back and forth here where the UFC are protested by firing a bunch of employees and halting <clears> shipping <throat> which we've gone over a couple times times here is an essential port for that is owned the the pier is owned by the united fruit company outright right um and then aravala responded by threatening to sequester properties but the whole thing ended up ending in a kind of like lukewarm proposal where it's like we'll raise employee wages a mm, little bit 10 percent. we're not going to even notice the labor unions so right there you go. And Aravalo, you know, not a hardline communist or anything like that, was just kind of like, okay, I guess this, I guess we'll accept this. Despite opposition from the U.S. State Department, the United Fruit Company, plantation owners, and conservative political parties 
An advocate for Arevalo's revolution would emerge as the frontrunner for the 1951 presidential election. This candidate would be Jacobo Arbenz, who was serving as Minister of Defense under Arevalo and was central to the coup which liberated the country from Frederico Ponce. The leftist Arbenz enjoyed wide support among the Guatemalan population, especially among indigenous and lower class populations. Arbenz would be opposed by two conservative candidates, one of which was a former uh, ubiquista who oversaw the implementation of vagrancy laws with brutal efficiency. When the elections ended in November, Arbenz emerged the victor with 60% of the popular vote, and for the first time in the 130-year history of Guatemala, executive power passed peacefully and on schedule. This is the first time, not only was, was the Aravalo election allegedly the first free election ever in Guatemala's history, the passing of the presidential torch from Aravalo to Arbenz was the first time in all of Guatemala's history that there was like a ceremonial, like a ceremonious exchange of power. That wasn't like a coup or like an assassination or anything like that. It's the first time that like the electoral process just kind of went as, as, as anticipated. Here's the, uh, the vote, the vote breakdown for that 1950 election, which, uh, saw Jacobo Arbenz come to power. See, this is where all the charisma is stored <laughs> right there. You know, see, see this no charisma. All right. And under that hat, I can only imagine that that hat is some kind of a disguise that shows what would be a concave of <laughs> just, just, just an utter lack of charisma. It's just like a, you could eat a bowl of cereal out of this man's forehead. Sorry, I'm getting too deep into phrenology here. Uh, moving on. <laughs> Do you want me to read this one? Yeah, go ahead. Guatemala's second democratically oh, elected. It my turn? I'm eh, sorry. It's whatever at this point. Demo second democratically elected president, Jacobo Arbenz, came from a relatively upper class family, although not without its traumas. Born to a Swiss pharmacist, married to a middle class Ladino, Jacobo enjoyed a higher standard of life than most in Guatemala. But as a result of his father's morphine addiction, fuck yeah, combined with Guatemala's volatile economic climate, the family would fall into financial instability. All that fucking morphine. Facing economic precarity, the Arbenz family would move to an estate owned by a family friend donated to them, quote, out of charity. As a consequence of the dire circumstances, Jacobo's father would commit suicide early in his adulthood. Fuck. That is, that's his parents there. That, that, that's uh, Jacobo Arbenz's two parents there. Yeah. So um, r rich, you know what I mean? Like for Guatemalan standards, but also there was a. The fuck? All right. Is, is Pat frozen for anybody else? All right, but I'm still good. All right. Shit. His computer is force restarting, so um we're just going to we're just going to sit tight for a little bit, you know, uh make some jokes about uh, you know, Jacobo's dead morphine addicted dad. It's okay because uh, you know, I'm a recovering addict. I'm allowed to do that. Uh, history class for me. <laughs> Homie can't just vibe. Los Guatemalcos got Pat. Yeah, no, I don't know who got Pat. Uh, I think he must have accidentally hit the wrong button. One of those little pop-ups that tells you, like, you know, it's time to restart your computer or something like that. Jacobo, Jakub, coincidence? I think not. You know? Yeah, no. Oh, there, oh. Is he back? Are we back? He might be back. There he is. There's our boy. Yeah. Uh, there you go. Uh, the CIA. I got in there right before <laughs> I started getting to the good stuff. Sorry, everybody. Uh, hey. Um, <laughs> all right. It's okay. I, I think this is the only uh, stream we've had where it's only been two so far. 
you know, issues with either audio or visual. So I think we're, we're, we're doing pretty good, you know? All right, let's go. Uh, so, okay, we read this part, yeah. All right, moving on from Jacobo's morphine-addicted father. Jacobo was an exemplary student and aspired to become an engineer or an economist, but his family's economic insecurity would extinguish his hopes of attending, of attending university. Um, lacking options, the young Arbenz would join the Guatemalan military in 1932. Similar to his academic endeavors, Arbenz would excel as a military cadet, with one fellow officer noting his abilities were such that officers treated him with a respect which was rarely granted to a cadet. Following graduation from the academy, Arbenz would occupy a junior officer position in Ubico's army, a position which situated him in the military squads that oversaw the gangs of chained convicts being marched between forced labor assignments, a duty which would have a radicalizing effect on the young officer. Arbenz would skillfully ascend to the ranks of Guatemala's military and by 1943 was promoted to captain, one of the most prominent positions available to a young officer. So um, here in uh, you know his career, those things that we talked about earlier with uh, Ubico's vagrancy laws, where there would be the chain gangs of those that didn't meet their uh, labor requirements, would be forced to break rocks and build roads. Ubico... Uh, Arbenz was actually one of the individuals that would enforce those. And during his time doing that, he would actually become somewhat uh, radicalized in the sense that he would be like, this is fucked up. Um, I don't think it should be like this. So, um, yeah, Ken, he's, he's, he's a, he's a very fascinating guy. Yeah. Well, we're going to learn a lot more about him. So, uh, you got this. Yeah. Arbenz would marry a high-class Salvadorian named Maria Villanova. Maria's elite upbringing would place her in upscale European learning institutions, which exposed her to many ideas and concepts, typically too subversive for the average Central American. Becoming more conscious of the poverty inflicted upon many Salvadorians, as well as personally traumatized by the frank brutality her father engaged in against the peasants, she would grow to resent her opulent lifestyle. Young and idealistic, she would take the family's luxury vehicle out to distribute food and clothing to the destitute of the country. See now, this is the kind of shit we're talking about, where it's just like, even if you are of the bourgeois class, it what you are doing doing right with like you know your your uh, uh ability right even if it's in favor of the working class if it's in favor of the proletariat it's not necessarily like a besmirchment for you to be like you know of a bourgeois class yes class trader she is a class trader but a good kind cops right i don't even think they can be considered a class trader because most of the time like what kind of work are they actually fucking doing Right. Or like, you know, the the uh, New York Steel Workers Union or something. A lot of times they're like racist as shit. And like, you know, they vote like in not great ways. And that's that's class traitorism, you know. Also, I, I'm trying to think like what actress she looks like, but it's just not coming to my mind. Um, all right. So a special little book there. Maria would have a great deal of influence on the young Arbenz, enlightening him on many worldly topics such as art, literature, and most importantly, politics. After receiving a copy of the Communist Manifesto at a Women's Congress meeting, Maria would leave the book on Jacobo's bedside table before leaving for a brief vacation. The manifesto would inspire the young officer, stimulating his taste for history, economics, and philosophy. Increasingly, his reading included Marxist writing, among them the works by Marx, Lenin, and Stalin. In an interview by Piero Glegesis, Maria would recall, Marcus theory offered Jacobo explanations that weren't available in other theories. What other theory can one use to analyze our country's past? Marx is not perfect, but he comes closest to explaining the history of our country. Which I think very many of uh, indigenous comrades that we've had on have said, you know, as much in as many words. That he may not be perfect, but, you know, he does a pretty damn good job. 
Um, so a lot of times, um, Jacob R. Benz is not like viewed as like a Marxist or a communist right. or anything like that. If we believe this later in life interview that Piero Iglesias does with um, Maria Villanova, she seems to say that Marxism had a pretty deep effect on um, our Benz. Right. This political transformation of Arbenz was partially influenced by his philosophical study, but his position would be solidified thanks to the counter-revolutionary behavior of the United States and the companies that hailed from it. Arevalo's reforms embittered the relationship between the revolutionary government and UFCO, who would in turn implore the U.S. government to intervene against the communistic policies, like many third world countries during the Cold War, Alienation from the United States consequently resulted in an increasing sympathy with the Soviet Union. In the words of party leader Sharnod MacDonald, the Soviet Union represented something new in the world rising in opposition to the old world. Three basic facts attracted our bends. It was governed by a class that was ruthlessly exploited. It had defeated illiteracy and raised the standard of living in a very short time. It had never harmed Guatemala. From a military standpoint, Arbenz was also deeply impressed by the Soviet triumph over Hitler, a victory which he attributed not only to the Russian people, but to their social system. I mean, the other thing is, I think that, like, what is it, like, three out of five books at that time would have been printed in the Soviet Union anyways? I'm not sure, but... I'm just kind of saying, like, you know how, um, maybe someone like Patrice Lumumba where right. you're coming you're you're leading this nationalist revolution you're trying to like nationalize and get these companies out the united states targets you even someone like fidel castro if i remember correctly like these aren't people that like come out into power and are like all right it's us in the soviet union but it's like when the united states blackballs you you're like i have no other choice like the soviet union's all i got i'm not you know um so like a lot of times you would have to like push them into the arms of the Soviet Union, which you're like almost like effectively demonizing them as being a puppet of to begin with. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy where the United States State Department will be like, oh, you can't do that. They're communists. Okay, embargo them, do all this. And then it's like, well, fuck, like now the Soviet Union's the only one who will do business with me. Are you good? Yeah, no, sorry. I got distracted by something. Uh, I was trying to figure it because uh, I've heard that statistic before that like, when the Soviet Union was printing books, like the majority of published books in the world, especially if they weren't in English, right? Uh, if they, they would even be translated into multiple languages because of the Soviet Union. Aside um, from his personal beliefs. <clears throat> Aside from his personal beliefs, Arbenz would develop strong personal relationships with a number of communist organizers within Guatemala. The nature of this development is touched on by Ronald Schneider in his 1959 work, Communism in Guatemala. The communists impressed Arbenz as the most honest and trustworthy, as well as the hardest working of his supporters. As the politicians of the other revolutionary parties lapsed into opportunism and concentrated on getting the lion's share of the spoils of office, the communists' stock rose in the president's eyes. The communists worked hardest in support of the president's pet project, agrarian reform. In contrast to the other politicians, the communists brought him answers and plans rather than problems and constant demands for the spoils of office. The Guatemalan Labor Party, Partido Guatemalco del Trabajo, or Guatemalteco del Trabajo, was a communist party in Guatemala. It existed from 1949 to 1998. Wow. It gained prominence during the government of Jacobo Arbenz. It was one of the main forces of opposition to the various regimes that followed Arbenz's overthrow and later became a constant constituent of the URNG Garilla coalition during the later phase of the country's civil war. <clears throat> also, this is a baller logo. So this is the uh, party that came to prominence pretty significantly under Jacobo Arbenz. And if you go forward one... This is the leader, uh, Joe, Jose Manuel Fortunoy. I don't know how to say it. Fortuny? Fortuny? It's really weird. 
Yeah, but he was also a important communist leader in Latin America. He became well known for his friendship with Guatemalan President Jacobo Arbenz and was one of the main advisors in his government, which lasted from 1951 to 1954. And then, spoiler alert, Arbenz was overthrown by a coup engineered by the United States in 1954, an event which drove Fortuny into exile along with many of his comrades. Um, Fortuny is, is uh, interviewed quite a bit in Shattered Hope also. But um, this just goes to show that, like, you know, Arbenz, uh, you know, was the first one to dis-outlaw, legalize. The first one to legalize the Communist Party in Guatemala. And he even had Communist Party, um, um, <laughs> and even um, had them as advisors in his government, the leaders of the Communist Party. Name names, Horace. Who do you want? Don't Don't put it on me like that. Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> you spent 2,000 points on that? I'm sorry, I spent the points. What, so is it like... Are you going to be the decision? Is it both of us or is it like, you know, just one of us? Do you want one of us to stay quiet? How many seconds? I don't even know. I feel like we've been silent long enough. All right, I feel like that. All right. That was it. There it was. That was our. That was it. I think he literally met the streamer. I no, I know. I know. <laughs> Horses against read, which is bullshit because I've seen him read. All right. So you're still eating. Having a resolute commitment to carrying on the reforms initiated by Arevalo, Arbenz entered the, his presidency with the same objective of building Guatemala to a status of political and economic independence. Foreign interests would not be completely excluded under Arbenz, but they would no longer be granted to the special concessions, which permitted the great landholders to avoid paying the taxes necessary for the country's social reforms. Despite his ideological commitment to communism, Arbenz believed that the first step to domestic autonomy was through capitalist modernization. Wow, building productive forces before you start just nationalizing? What? I'm sorry, I got kind of distracted by that. Uh, not straying far from Aravalo's spiritual socialism or the policy uh, prescriptions recommended by the IBRD study mission. During his inauguration, he explicitly announced his goal to convert Guatemala from a country bound by a predominantly feudal economy into a modern capitalist one. I mean, because this is the 1950s, and even if you go to Indonesia, if you go to, like, uh, pretty much any of the other, like, you know, uh, anti-colonialist, you know, movements during the 50s and 60s, right? If you actually look at what they're saying, uh, most of them are saying that, like, we want to build up, like, a capitalist market yeah. it, that, that is, like, you know, uh, because that's what, that's what, like, you know, old school Marxist Leninists thought. Like, you need to build capitalism before you can have communism right and um this is i kind of wanted to just like talk about like the complexity of this situation where if you are going off of the word of his wife maria um or marie i think it was maria um she stated that the communist manifesto had a huge effect on him he was reading marx he was reading stalin he was reading lenin um his he was very close friends with many communists he um allowed the communist party to develop and to be legalized he appointed communists into his political cabinet. Um, but when he gets up on that podium, he says that we will we will have a modern capitalist economy to bring us out of feudalism. Right. Because again, that is what traditional Marxist Leninists thought, even in like the 1950s. The process of modernization would be achieved through the implementation of accessible tax in incentives, carefully monitored pricing, adjusted tariff regulation, and funding improved agriculture technology to replace the outmoded practices being utilized. Outside of policy reforms and technological innovation, a major obstacle to the process of development was the profoundly unequal state of land ownership in Guatemala. The existing plantation structure dominated the majority of Guatemala's rich arable land to produce coffee and bananas destined for the international market. 
rich arable land. This dynamic fostered Guatemala's dependence on imported basic foodstuffs, which limited its potential for long-term growth. Arbenz hoped to promote a more rational economy and a unified state by diversifying Guatemala's agricultural production and redistributing land more efficiently. And so on. this is like not even like not even okay go ahead. You no, no 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 you go you do it okay so this is like even just like not even just like this isn't even like marxist economics this is almost just like basic economics like hey almost all of our land is owned by other people for the purpose of growing things that they're selling we can't even afford enough we can't even grow enough food to feed us so we have to buy food imported food stuffs to satiate our starving population right. um Let's take some land and grow food on it that we can eat as opposed to just using all of it for coffee and bananas. Does that sound good to everybody? And everyone's like, yeah, that 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 doesn't sound too um, out of the range of, uh, you know, what we're going to be doing here. So um, it'd be nice not to starve. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then here's a, a billboard of sorts here. It says President Arbenz delivers on his promise. Farmers, here is your land. Defend it. Care for it, cultivate it. This is in 1954. Um, so this is part of uh, central to his political uh, political mission. The political objective is land reform back to the farmers, out right. of the hands of huge corporations. But it's not without its reasonable stipulations. So let's learn more about this. Right, and this is also kind of harkens back to like what we were talking about before with like the Irish potato famine and stuff, and that like you know they're growing a crop that isn't actually indigenous to the land, and it's a mono crop, and they are growing so much of this one crop purely for uh uh uh, uh exploitate or extractive you know economic uh, uh, reasons. Arbenz developed a modest policy of land redistribution known as Decree Nine Hundred. It would have been cooler if we called it Decree 9000, but, you know, whatever. Decree 9000! Uh, which targeted plantations over 223 acres and specifically sought to expropriate idle acreage, not actively being used for cultivation. As of 1950, the 32 largest plantations totaled 1.8 million acres, of which roughly 16 million acres were not under cultivation. A major reason for the massive amount of unused land was Guatemala's antiquated process of leaving hundreds of acres to fallow so the soil could be naturally replenished instead of utilizing modern methods of fertilization, which, with, you know hindsight is actually really bad don't do that within these parameters the primary plantations slated for expropriation were 1059 properties with an average size of 4300 acres the plan the plantation owners who would be the victims of the reform process would be entitled to compensation based on the owner's official tax declarations that part is important that's um, gonna so, yeah. that's gonna come up later <laughs> this was not just like a like a, a marauding band of uh you know forcible land annexation of kinds this was a um very like logical and moderate kind of way of redistributing land so they're like hey you own all these millions of acres of land if you're not using it we're taking it so right. you, the United Fruit Company is not being kicked out of Guatemala. The United Fruit Company gets to keep all that land that they have that they're actively growing bananas on. And if you have like land that you're not, that's idle, we're taking that. And it's only if you have over 223 acres, even if you have idle land under 223 acres, you can keep it. But if you have one of these giant ones and you're not using the land, we're taking it. And also we will entitle you to the compensation based on your tax declaration. Now, Imagine that's gonna a problem because what the United Fruit Company is declaring in its taxes is, according to them, very, 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 very like severely undercut. We're we're just we're just a little uh, you know farm company. We don't have that much land. <laughs> we're barely raking in a profit with all the land we have. The agrarian reform was unanimously approved by the Guatemala National Assembly on June 17, 1952, and went into effect immediately. By June 1954, close to 1 million acres of idle land was 
was expropriated and distributed to 87,000 Guatemalans in the form of freeholds or peasant cooperatives. Approximately 100,000 campesino families were granted land through Decree 900, which is about 500,000 individuals. Virtually all of those who benefited from the redistribution process were indigenous. In addition to direct land distribution, the Arbenz administration provided over $8 million in loans and credit to blossoming agricultural endeavors. Thousands of farmers would also receive technical aid and in-the-field demonstrations of modern agricultural practices. The policies implemented by Arbenz would result in an overall increase in product productive capacity. According to political scientist Neil Pearson, or is it Pearson, all existing data on the land reform, quote, seem to indicate that agrarian reform unleashed new productive energies from both the peasants and the uh, fincheros who pr whose previously idle land was put to use. Even the opponents of Arbenz conceded the success of Decree 900, with the U.S. Embassy noting a 15% increase in corn production, 74% in rice, 21% in wheat in 1953. This yield improvement would also apply to cash crops, as the 1953-54 coffee crop being the second highest in Guatemalan history. Decree 900 was unique in terms of land reform programs, in the sense that it targeted specifically idle land, which prompted many landowners to expediently cultivate land to protect it from expropriation. So yeah, it makes sense that this would make efficiency rise, because if there's idle land, one of two things is going to happen to it. Either that, um, yeah, either, either the plantation owner is going to be like, holy shit, I better plant some shit and start cultivating on this right now before they come and take it, or they take it and some likely indigenous people are just going to grow food on it that they can eat. Right. So like one way or another, that, that land's going to get used. So you can see how not really radical this land reform program really was. Like there's a lot of like, concessions being made towards the United Fruit Company. Be like, hey, you want to keep the land? Grow something on it. Use it. Get, get going, yeah. Use it or lose it, asshole. Exactly, yeah. Also, Hashkush, thank you for stating that finquero means farmer, in case anyone was wondering. I hope I'm pronouncing it kind of right, at least. Decree. Right. Oh, do you want to take this? I got it. Right. Decree 900 would have resulted in a significant improvement in Guatemala's standard of living, most significantly in the rural areas. The overall price of food decreased and per capita purchasing power rose. An increased percentage of the population would be able to afford consumer goods, such as radios, shoes, small appliances, and even automobiles, a process which has an overall healthy effect on the economy. Decree 900 would not exclusively benefit those families who received land directly. The increase in land ownership decreased the overall labor pool of Guatemala, thus raising overall wages for agricultural workers. Pearson would conclude many thousands of peasants lived, mu peasants lived much better lives than ever before as a result of Decree 900. Um, so this is the more like basic economic type stuff. And I think that this is like one of the main things that went into the Great Depression is that when you, when consumer prices rise and wages uh, decrease and you have like the largest portion of your population, which is like the laborers that can't even afford the consumer goods that you're producing. You know what I mean? Like this is not how a fluent, that's, this is not how a fluent economy works. So in Guatemala, once these, the lowest rung of the civilization in terms of economics is able to get a little bit more money, not have to worry about subsistence as much. Now they're buying shoes, they're buying microwaves, maybe they'll buy a car or something like that. Like overall in the cycle of economic m m movement, this is very good for the economy. And also the more, um, the more people that you, that get land, now there's not as many that, that, that have the need for like back breaking wage labor so now if there's less of those people that means wages go up because labor is more in demand or there's less of a surplus of the labor to satiate the demand should i say right here is our bends with uh, a group of indigenous women the events which followed the agrarian reform program would tragically alter the course of guatemalan history before detailing the ensuing events, it is essential to understand the state of the world in 1954. Following the end of World War II, the United States ascended to a position of global dominance, rivaled only by the less wealthy and still recovering Soviet Union. 
the once tenuous alliance between the USA and USSR, which existed under FDR, had been shattered by the Truman administration. In stark contradiction to Roosevelt's good neighbor policy, which reduced US foreign intervention, the Truman Doctrine exalted the United States as protector of freedom throughout the world, a nation which held a moral responsibility to intervene militarily to contain communist expansion. Immediately after the fall of the Axis powers, the United States embarked on a worldwide campaign of foreign occupation and manipulation. The Guatemalan Revolution unfortunately ran parallel with this operation. This is, uh, go forward. And this is the last slide here. Um, by the time Guatemala initiated its land reform program in 1953, the United States had meddled in the domestic affairs of at least eight countries, including come off the heels of the disreputable Korean War and a clandestine coup in Iran carried out by the fledgling CIA. The Red Scare was in full effect, and the redistribution of lands dominated by oligarchs raised the suspicions of the United States of the U.S. State Department. Despite the land reform program following the directors of the capitalist IBRD, and largely modeled after the U.S. initiated land reform program of post-war Japan, you can look this up in Japan after the war. When the United States got there and there was U.S. advisors, they did a very similar land reform program to what happened in Guatemala. This was not like, um, you know, so so it really lays bare the hypocrisy of the United States because the moment that they run to Japan, they're like, oh yeah, this is perfectly logical that we need to do this. The IRBD says that this is logical for them to do, but once they do it in Guatemala, now this is communism. It's about uh, who's benefiting, Pat. Yeah. Go forward. I, I forgot. There's actually one more. I'm going to read that. Um, Sam, the dono link is right in where the sub, or the, the gifted sub thing should be. It should be right in the bottom right corner, the purple button. Um, so last thing here, so the Guatemalan revolution differs from many revolutions throughout history due to its relatively bloodless and democratic nature. There was no protracted civil war, no widespread casualties of non-combatants, nor an imposition of despotic authority. Thanks to significant popular support, the Guatemalan revolution was realized over a few short months with minimal casualties. The arbiters of the revolution remained true to the democratic principles and allowed free elections to ensue. After democratic elections, administrations did not engage in witch hunts targeting political opponents, nor did they embark on hasty collectivization campaigns. The policies enacted by the revolutionary government were moderate, popular, and well-planned, largely inspired by Western financial institutions, which raises the question, why would the United States feel the need to intervene against this government? The answer is a combination of mutually dependent factors, corporate financial interest, and rabid U.S. Cold War fervor. So that's the end of what we'll be talking about today. Um, tune in on, I guess it would be next Sunday at this point, where we're going to be continuing the Guatemalan discussion, um, following William Blum, Blum's section of Killing Hope that is going to cover the 1950s coup. And we're, then we're going to really dig into the nitty gritty of the U.S. involvement and what the U.S. did to overthrow uh, this leader, Jacobo Arbenz, and the things that he was doing. So this was really just to just to show that the progression of what led right. to that point, everything that Arbenz was doing, what was Decree 900, what was the Land of Horde program and so on and so forth so i hope that this has everyone nice and primed nice and edged up for um <laughs> the coup that, that that is about to happen next week and we'll go over that next week so yeah um that'll be next week probably on a sunday uh this coming wednesday uh we will be going over peru uh with our very own seb's dev oh thank you hash oh my god thank you for gifting 10 tier one subs Wow, Holy shit. Guys, that is 10 more subs to our potential, our goal of 1,000 subs, where once it is achieved, Johnny and I will go to Vietnam, and we will stream from Vietnam. We will. We promise. Thank you so much, Ashkush, for constantly supporting the stream. And it's like, you know, uh, we will go to all the museums, and we will live stream. Uh, if, we can, if we can figure out how to do it, we'll live stream us going through the museums, right? Uh, cause that's my favorite thing that I want to do. Um, what the fuck is it? Yeah. One mil subs for North Korea or just like another well, thousand. About, I don't know. We won't be able to stream from North Korea. Probably. probably not. Probably won't be able to stream from North Korea, but you know, whatever. We'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. All right. Um, but yeah, so this Wednesday, Peru with our very own Seb's dev, uh, and then Friday, Friday uh, the acclaimed YouTuber, Azor Scapecoat along with Grom coming on to discuss social democracy. Is it all it's cracked up to be? Social democracy. Good? Bad? <laughs> a 
let's find out. Fucking and Sunday, we are resuming Guatemala discussion. Yes. The next step in Guatemala, which is the U.S. backed coup against the very respectable government of Jacobo Arbenz. How do you feel about the, the uh, Arbenz now? Uh, has, is this the most that you've gone into him? Uh, would you say this is the most you've gone into his government and character? I mean, like, I read, like, I think halfway through uh, Shattered Hope before, you know? Okay, and yeah. I was kind of, like, on the fence about, like, if he's a Marxist or not, you know? Uh, and, like, uh, it seems like, um, what the hell is it, uh, William Bloom? I don't want to give away too much for when we go over it, but it seems like he's also of the mind that, like, he's not... Oh, thank you, Maverick, for gifting a Tier 1 sub. Oh, um what the fuck is it? Uh, I think like William Bloom is also kind of on the thing. Keep receipts just in case. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, oh, and tomorrow we're also recording an episode with Work Stoppage Pod. Um, you know, so keep keep an eye out for that. You know, wherever podcasts are sold or wherever you listen to them from. Um, I read it, I suppose. I don't know. What I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um. And uh, I think the, either like sometime, I think next week, right? I need to reach out to Rick and figure out what day he wants to do this on because I think he might be ready. Um, we are going to ha- host a panel discussion with uh, the two hosts of the Decolonized Buffalo, Rick and uh, Plants Fanon. And I believe we will also be having, uh, you know, famous chatter Red Falcon on the panel as well um and yeah it's it's gonna be man subversive history is absolutely popping the fuck off right yeah. now and it is uh thanks in part well it is thanks mostly to everyone in chat that supports us and they like yes. to hang out with us but also our peers and our predecessors that have accepted us to the point where they're inviting us to do stuff with them um that is the reason why we're so fucking busy um we're really fortunate for this so thank you everybody for being here along with the ride with, and with the ride possibly next week uh if you want uh tweet at this uh the the east is a podcast uh and hopefully next wednesday or sometime next week we'll be able to have cena from uh the east is a podcast to help us go through uh the coup of mosaddegh in iran um you know so tweet at um i'm gonna give you their their twitter handle and you're gonna tweet at them to be like i heard you're gonna be on uh, the subversive history Twitch stream. Is this true? Be cool, chat. I think they're great. Be cool about it. Don't <laughs> get weird about it. Tweet at them and uh, <laughs> tell them that you're very excited to, to see them on uh, the subversive history Twitch stream. All right? Don't be weird about it. All right? I got faith in you. And then he'll block us all. Uh, he he will block us all probably. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm assuming that he's got like a family and kids and stuff and like you know a job or something that like you know prevents him from answering every uh, Twitter message. But it's gonna happen, all right. By hook or by crook. I hope that doesn't have any kind of like racist connotations because I didn't really think about it. Um, but anyways, right. Busy upcoming week, busy next week, you know, uh, and uh, we're hopefully giving you the the best edutainment uh, that you deserve. And I think you know it's it's been a hot minute and it's time uh, get those those O sevens ready, right? Because we're gonna be raiding famous horse, friend of the stream. La Salam, everybody. Stay strong. We love you. Um, you know, and uh, see you Wednesday. Wednesday. You know, have a good night. Be safe out there. Hugs and kisses.